makes good content, doesn't it? Boogers? Always. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And I'm Ben Smith. Ben Smith has been on the episode before, but uh, or the podcast, I should say. But uh, yeah, this is a good three-person episode this time around. Uh, and Ben's here because he went with us on the Washington BDR Trail uh, this last month. We took a little trip out there. Ian, do you want to kind of describe yeah, what that is? Well, Ben's been with us for a number of things. Like usually... Uh, when we leave town, it's a lot of, a lot of the vlogs, you're going to see him and his YXZ on, whether it be Winchester Bay and, and in the future, very likely going to, you know, I mean, dude, you're stuck with us. It is what it is. <laughs> so, uh, but I've been, it, I've been trying to get away from you for years. I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> as it relates to the backcountry discovery route, kind of coming from, um, uh, bikes, adventure bikes, stuff like that, lo- having kind of a love for overlanding. I stumbled across the BDRs. I don't even really remember how. And there's this series of tra- uh, trails and maps that Butler Map has has developed for the backcountry discovery routes. I think they're doing pretty much every single state in the West. They're about to develop Wyoming. Wyoming will be released in 2021, and then they are um, they did Maine, but predominantly it's a West Coast based effort and. It's all, it's an off-road trip that basically goes north to south through the state that they're targeting. And it kind of became a little bit of an obsession of mine because not a lot of people were doing it on UTV and we had UTVs. We want to go out. We want to wheel. We want to see some stuff that, you know, I mean, it's almost like bucket list type stuff and, you know, by and large, we're just starting. We're just beginning. You know, we've got, we, we've knocked this one out, you know, granted, you know, we'll get into it a little bit more about how this trip went, but in relation to some of the other ones, we're looking to knock some of those off over the next few years as well. You know, Utah's on our list, Colorado is on my list. And then, uh, there's also a sequence of trails that works from Yuma, Arizona, all the way to the Canadian border. And that one's really on my list. That's definitely on the list. It is. You know, where it gets to be real difficult is logistics. I think everybody and their dog sees what the, the, what we're doing uh, with these type of BDR type runs, these type of overland runs. I, you know, it intrigues a lot of people. I know, I know it's going to be an emerging market. We've talked about it. But one thing that really comes into play is logistics. It's always the most, tra- it's not even the trail. It's the logistics of the operation that kind of takes up the most planning, takes up, uh, it's basically the decipher whether or not you're going to be able to pull it off or not. Yeah, the very first thing that people don't realize is that when you go out on a trail ride, you're just basically planting down the trailer somewhere, Yep. going out to point A, and point B is back at your trailer. Trailhead to trailhead, <laughs> yep. And so something like this, where you're you're expanding and you're stretching way further out, you could be doing something to the fact of six, eight, 1,300 miles, depending on which, which route you're going on, and uh, doing a loop of that magnitude would be pretty serious, let alone uh, doing the stretch initially. So right. uh, a lot of times you're talking about transporting cars from point A to point B across the state. Uh, before and after, you're talking about people. And you're talking about you know uh, resources being planted if you're doing super long stuff. Uh, snowmobilers are kind of used to this where they, they go stash fuel in the woods and, and stuff like that uh, for the guys that get real deep in the backcountry. But um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that a lot of thought that goes into this that once you start diving in, you get, kind of get overwhelmed. And until a UTV is a little bit more accepted on a highway, a county highway or a federal highway, which may or may not happen down the road, we'll see. It's going to continue to be a challenge, you know, right. for, for one of our ventures that we're looking at doing. You guys will see some more detail on it as we approach it. We are, we're having to drive roughly about 600, 700 miles to the actual trailhead and then have somebody deadhead back home. They're essentially there to drop us off. So we're being dropped off in one point, picked up in another point, which that other point is 1,400 miles away. It's a pretty big undertaking. And those are, if you can answer those questions, if you got the ability to uh, to organize that, these runs are feasible. But yeah, it's, it's one of the biggest obstacles. Now, just to kind of clarify and bring some context to this, uh, a lot of this BDR stuff, again, is 
been done by adventure bikes, people that have licensed motorcycles to go both on road and off road. And then they're packing real light. They're doing real fast little stretches yeah. here and there. They're, they're going to things that sometimes UTVs don't really make it to. Um, they have a little bit more options on POIs that they can get to, uh, things like that. But uh, jumping into this, you guys actually did this before. We had a, a discussion about it before, about doing the Washington BDR, and you guys were essentially the first UTVs to do that um, from Oregon to Canada. So when you guys jumped into this the first time, what was some of the first logistics that kind of uh, you go back to on this trip thinking we can do this differently and better? And, and what kind of was separating these two trips that we're taking that you had one last fall, you did it, and then we went this summer and did it? Ben's wife. That's in a, in a nutshell why it was easier. And then combine that with the fact that uh, Washington is a little easier for us to organize because from the North Trailhead to the South Trailhead, we could leave your house right now and in three hours be there. That definitely helps, you know, so from an organizational standpoint. And, and the other thing is, too, is like we actually had it plotted last year that in the event that we had a problem while we were out on the trail – we could drive. Uh, we could drive home. Like if somebody couldn't come pick us up. Like I had a. I had an off road loop from Orville, Washington. Not a loop, off road route, plotted from Orville, Washington to to my farm. All you know. That's. 160, 170 miles through farm country. It would have been really boring, but, you know, in the event that somebody couldn't have got us, we, I, I had a, a way you out. You know how to get home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the other stuff, like when we start to take on Utah, Colorado, places like that, we're not going to have those options. So, Ben, going into this last trip we did on Washington, what was your kind of like, that was something that we need to remember or something that we need to do different? You know, as far as where we were staging, where we were ending, things like that, it's always been, Ian is fantastic about these planning and getting these routes and figuring out how where why all that kind of stuff and and i'm more of the the mechanical side of it making sure that our gear and our loadout is is appropriate for what we're trying to undertake um our original trip uh was simpler because it was just the two of us that 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 alleviates a lot of headache when you're only dealing with two guys two vehicles when on this trip there was what Five cars. Five cars, yeah. six guys. That that adds a tremendous amount of work on both sides of it, both in in the logistical trail side of it and also the the logistical of the, the loadout side of it. Right. Fortunately we had some some help with one of the riders. He had two vehicles, so some people that didn't have them were able to come along and, and do their thing with, with us. Which, which helps tremendously, but that also creates some stress involved too because, yeah, they've been right, these vehicles have been ridden, but how are they with maintenance? How are they with, you know, and... Coming from a mechanic background and mindset, you're you're questioning all these things in, in the back of your head. Is this car going to survive one way or the other? Absolutely. And what's the most common thing that's going to happen if it does happen, right? Exactly. And a quick disclaimer, it's very natural for Ben to think about other people and think about their cars. Because I can tell you firsthand, like, like I can wrench on stuff, but oftentimes Ben just gets irritated watching me <laughs> wrench on stuff. And then just <laughs> basically is like, no, no, I got this. Go, go, go operate it. Go check Facebook. <laughs> what, what's that SNL skit? Like a, yeah. a move. Move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Either that or I'll go to retrieve a tool. Next thing you know, he's under the car and I'm like, can't find it because he's already okay. doing it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so. Uh, just, uh, you mentioned the, the extra car, just a real big shout out as we talk about this trip and the logistics of organizing and getting people moved around. Uh, Rich Maxi from Octane Toy Box brought us. Um, he came along on the trip and he wasn't able to be here for the recording, but, um, you know, he, he, he essentially just signed up for something. He had no clue really what to expect and, uh, was willing to bring a second car and let us have people put their foot into the throttle. So yeah, he is legitimately one of the most selfless men I've ever met. And it just, you know, he was just committed to getting it done, committed to solutions when guys had trouble. Just, I mean, you want to talk about the kind of guy that you want on the trail wheeling with you. There he is. Yeah, and there's there's something to be said. You know, a lot of people, when they refer business to one company or a different place, you know, a lot of that goes into their experience with the people there, right? And after my experience with Rich on the trail, after all the head headaches we had and after all the stuff that we had, I have no problem recommending people go to his shop because he's going to take care of you 100% guaranteed. He's not going to back down. So Yeah, yeah he's Oct a stud. 
and he's out of uh, the Sumner store, Sumner, right? Sumner, Washington. Yeah, yeah, so Octane Toy Box, Rich Maxi. They do a great um, job out of both of those locations. For sure. Yeah. And they got some cool builds, too. So. They do. Uh, which was one of the cars he brought was one of his older uh, builds that he had supercharged, right? Uh, an XP4 1000. Um, super cool car. Um, but we'll get into a little bit of that that storyline too. Yeah. So uh, there's but, a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be here for a while. This will be a long episode. So <laughs> if you're uh, new to the podcast or if you are uh, we're just expecting a quick 30 minute jaunt we're, to work, we're about to go Rogan style on this one. <laughs> this will be a Rogan style <laughs> podcast for sure. Yeah. Zach's beard's going to be significantly longer after this one concludes. <laughs> It'll go off screen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we, we had been talking about doing this for a while, and we eventually solidified getting it done, and uh, we headed out, and uh, we've talked before about the little farmhouse that we've stayed in Conconoli when we went yeah. up for the, the Jamboree. It seemed like a logical staging point. Yeah. It, was easier for, it was easy for Rich to get to on the uh, from the west side. It's super easy for us to get to on the east side, and... Uh, we're parking some pretty expensive gear, some pretty expensive machinery, uh, and it was nice to have people that were willing to put their eyes on it at all times. Right. So just to talk a little bit about kind of the goal and the and going into this, the goal of run, running the backcountry discovery route on Washington wasn't really just to say we made it border to border, but it was more about uh, getting out, experiencing the different terrain, the trails, showing that, filming that doing all, all the different experiential stuff on trail. Yeah. Uh, and so we had some filmers come with us, uh, some guys from uh, Rev Mamiya. Yeah. And uh, those guys are pretty awesome. Shout out to Bam Bam and Brian. Going into that, we kind of had the idea that, well, we have to figure out where we're going to stage, where we're going to park these expensive trailers and trucks and tools and all this other stuff. And Conkin only made sense because we're going to go to Canada. We're going to do this trip south, and then we were going to loop back, and we needed it to kind of just be one central place, right? And Conkin only gave us a, the opportunity to do the first leg of the trip up to Canada, come back down to camp, and if there were any issues that we ran into, we could resolve them before heading out to the rest right. of the trip, right? And we had the unknown of a, a second uh, car that was being brought to us that we had no experience with. So there's a lot of question marks on, like like Ben, you're saying, is this car going to survive? And so having that extra kind of pit stop along the way really made a ton of sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, kind of what where this kind of derived from is I'll let the cat out of the bag. Ben and I are actually 14 years old still. And when we go out and do awesome stuff, <laughs> and in, in a nutshell, it's one of those things where we're like, uh, we'll show people pictures of it. We'll talk about it. And you're like, yeah, you got to get out there, dude. Come on, let's go. And then next thing you know. We're, li we're staging, we're lining up, and we're on trail. I mean, that's pretty much in a nutshell what it is. It just has to do with the fact that, I mean, he and I were actually talking about it about a week or two ago. It's it's one of those things where you're out there on these on these areas seeing these sites that you don't, don't normally get to see, drifting your car around these corners and stuff, doing, these du doing all this Dukes of Hazard type stuff. And he and I kind of get a little bit giddy where we're just like, man, I can't can't believe we're out here doing this. This is awesome. It's almost like a well-struck golf ball. You just can't wait to tee it up and go do it again. And that's kind of where this comes into play. For sure. And so uh, we headed out, we camped at, at the uh, farmhouse. Uh, and if you guys are interested in what the farmhouse is or want to reserve it, it's available at sidebysideguys.link slash farmhouse. So check that out. Really great family. We've talked about them before. Yeah. Um, and uh, they have year-round rentals. So if you're a snowmobiler or whatever, uh, you can, that's that's God's country for snowmobiles. So, um, so first day we arrived and, uh, we didn't necessarily, you know, start hitting the trail right away. We had some mechanic stuff to do. I, I had, uh, the, the razor that I'm driving the turbo, uh, completely sagged out to the ground basically. And, uh, the Fox shocks that were on it were the front seals are blown. So we're looking at what options we're going to take on revalving those shocks and whatnot. And again, Rich Maxi to the rescue, uh, volunteered some spare, uh, Walker Evans shocks for the car. So, uh, he brought those with him. And so as soon as we showed up, we, we pulled the jack stands or the, the car jack out and the, the, tr the razor and started taking the shocks off. Yeah. And I peeked over and I saw Ben basically going move and then <laughs> <laughs> starting to rip it, helping ripping your car apart. Yeah. So. It was kind of nice. Like, you know, I, I'd, I'd start, working on something, Ben would be working on something, he'd move off of that, I'd move over, he'd move over. It was yeah. it was kind of a, a little mechanic shop in the back of the trailer, so uh, so that was cool. Uh, and then I proceeded to lose a nut, uh, <laughs> not my nut, but the shock's nut, and uh, just slipped out of my hands, and I've still not found that nut, Ben. <laughs> so 
<laughs> Talk about uh, planning for the unexpected, right? Well, Ben and I went into OMAC to retrieve a nut for you, and coincidentally, <laughs> we needed Bud Light, too, so it worked out fine. Yeah, you found a few extra things to bring back with you. Right. But, uh, and then, and then of course, you know, by the time you came back, I had already planned for this somehow subconsciously and, and had one of those in my toolbox. I just didn't know about it and, uh, put that back on the car. So thanks for going to OMAC for me, Ben. No I appreciate the, uh, purchase, but, uh, it was kind of a <laughs> nice segue for how the rest of the week went. It was, it yeah. was, that was kind of like the precursor, the, the foreshadowing of the right. rest of the trip. So, uh, and then you were doing something. I saw you wrenching on your car for a little bit. I got to tell you, I have no idea what I was ranting on. <laughs> I have no clue. I think he was looking busy so he didn't have to help with the shop. <laughs> I that's think probably, that's exactly that's what it was. That's very plausible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you were doing something. I know you brought your torque wrench for something. Um, but, uh, or no, you bought a torque wrench later. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so then the rest of the crew showed up and the cars and we got everything ready. And then we hit the trail in the morning, right? No, it was that day. It was we, that day. It was that day. Yeah. So yeah. we... We took the morning, and I think it was about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, something like that. Yeah, uh, we we left the farmhouse at noon, but yeah. by the time we got north of Conkin, only it was about 1. We stopped in town, yeah. fueled up, yeah. and uh, kind of re- regrouped and, and headed up. Um, and so then we made it uh, roughly 30 miles. 40 miles. 40 miles. Yep, to the uh, nose. Up to the up to a hill climb that Ask we found. Ask me why I know that. <laughs> <laughs> we found this nice little meadow that then went up a, a nice you know zigzag up the mountain, and uh, lo and behold, there was somebody new. Chad was coming, yeah. and and put a challenge flag right in the middle of well, the mountain. Well, first and foremost, we were ripping. Yeah, we, we were, were flat out ripping. Like I I got to a couple spots and. I couldn't have had to wait more than 20 minutes for you guys, but whatever, you know, we'll, we'll cover that later. But no, <laughs> um, no, it was cool. Like I, I would, I would pull over and uh, hear you guys and know by your engine RPM that you guys are ripping too. It was a killer ride up until some misfortune, but. Uh, so before we get into that, yeah, we, li- we covered Conkin only before and I'll still maintain yeah, yeah. that. That's like one of my new favorite places for to sure. go ride. For sure. for sure. You know, it was just one of those things where uh, at the time before we got to that one point, like the only hiccup that we were having is the places that I was stopping. We were all getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. But outside of that, oh, it was were horrible. we were having a great time. Like yeah. it, every, spirits were high. We'll just go with that. Yeah, we were all uh, looking good and, and having a great time. And, and I totally left the off the can of off in the garage. I had it. I was like, there's going to be mosquitoes there somewhere. Everywhere. And God, they were eating me alive. For I was sure. probably double the size yeah. after I was puffed up <laughs> after that thing. But um, yeah, so we hit this hill and and we all kind of came to a stop. And I was like, why? What are we doing? And then all of a sudden, the next thing I see is, is uh, Bam Bam going up the hill in the four-seater. Yeah. So, so basically what happened is I saw this hill, Ben and I saw it the year prior. It's been there for a while. So it's like this. I'm pretty sure it's been there for a while. Yeah. It's not a sketchy, it's not a sketchy hill climb or anything like that, but it just gets a lot of runoff. So I went up it and didn't like my line because I was trying to high center. I was trying to straddle the runoff. And the best thing to do is stick to the right of the runoff and then towards the top, let your, let your tire dip into the runoff. So I went up about halfway and then back down to bit get basically get the car centered to the right well while i backed down rich went right at it and he took it on he, t- he took it, yeah he took it down he's in his xp pro and then i went up it and i made it up it you know it, it cleared it like a car had no problem with it but the a-arm did <laughs> the a-arm had a big well, problem and with let's it. not forget that this whole thing started before the camera people could get out and start <laughs> filming dude i don't think i just go <laughs> Yeah, there was no hesitation yeah. in the X3. I got it on the I got it on the GoPro, so but you have it on the GoPro, yeah. and, and uh, I have it from the cell phone down at the bottom. But you know, and Rich had it on the cell phone too, and we'll cover what happened with that. <laughs> Poor Rich, <laughs> Poor I feel Rich. so bad for, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, after the the first couple attempts, that got it was already rutted out. It was, and then you guys took it down probably another six inches at least, and it was pretty much you know a climb for sure, and. Uh, that that dirt was a lot softer than it looked like it was going to be. A lot softer. It wasn't compact. It wasn't rocky. It was pretty much just loose topsoil. The producers to this day still give me a hard time for not capturing that because uh, when they pulled up while I was going up it, they go, dude, you had like an explosion of dirt come off yeah. the back of your car. I'm yep. like, well, I guess it would have looked sick. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you made it up, and I thought everything was honky dory. No, my car killed and then, it. Killed and then it. killed it. Yeah. yeah, and then 
and killed something. And yeah, then, killed and, the A-arm. And then the rest, <laughs> and then the rest of the crew went around up yeah. the zigzag. And I was like, you know what? That don't look too bad. I mean, the sand, the dirt looks soft enough. Yeah. I'm not going to risk anything. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'll go up it. I'm used to doing this kind of stuff in the razor. And your 2,000 pounds worth of gear that you were packing <laughs> had a say in it. <laughs> I was well overloaded for that uh, exp- yeah. experience. But uh, it it took a few tries, but I never gave up and got got her up to the top. And Ben, I hooked on to you for the last 10 feet uh, where the uh, X3 decided to dig a 10-foot hole. I did find it a little ironic that you connected to the lightest car on the trail <laughs> to It was the one in the back up. of the line. <laughs> and and I, will, I will fully admit that was an entirely new experience being... A winch point. Yeah. <laughs> Never been a winch point. Yeah, I will say your car moved slowly and graciously. <laughs> I wasn't entirely sure you weren't going to flip me over. Yeah. I felt my right size tires start to get a little light. <laughs> so but, I was at about a 40 degree angle from him yeah. pulling off of his rear hook. And uh, yeah, he, his back end moved a little bit. <laughs> my, my favorite part of that whole thing, I mean, if we're going to take a positive out of it, because uh, it, it took me out, but like... Ben like had this Larry David moment where he was like confessing to Rich, watching us attack this hill, watching how gnarly it was. And Ben li- literally gets out behind us and starts admitting, no, no, I'm not going. <laughs> it's like, I'm going around. <laughs> well, one no. of the things that I was looking at was 40 miles into what? A 600 mile trip. Seven. Was not really the place that I wanted to. I wanted to break something. <laughs> you know, you, I'm just you figured saying. you would just leave that up to someone else. Yeah, Chad was there. <laughs> he had it. I didn't need to do that. Ian's here for footage. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I got my way up the hill. The filmers got some nice footage of that, and then and then we went to go proceed. And I got out of the car to figure out like what's going on. And then lo and behold, everybody's huddled around Ian's driver's side yep. a arm. And uh, tacoed that thing all, all all sorts of weird ways. There was no hope for that thing. I mean, honestly, the only hope that we would have had would have been a portable welder and something to tack it to. But, you know, I limped it back to camp, limped it back to the farmhouse. It was uh, 40 miles. Took me about, eh, it took me about two hours, somewhere in that ballpark, maybe an hour and a half. Um, Your tire was, was towed out pretty, pretty hard. Yeah. You know, in a nutshell, but look, this is what happened. I didn't want to be on film without my 32s and my methods. So my method <laughs> race rims. So the first thing I thought is like, how do I just jack this car up and get it so that I can buy myself 24 hours to go get my dope new tires and wheels? It worked. It worked. It worked. Yeah. Yeah. Look at it. Look at it now. <laughs> <laughs> the plan all came together That's as expected. Right. That's right. So yeah, at that point, uh, Ian, you you fell back to camp and, yeah. uh, and Ben, you took over lead navigator uh, role. Uh, as you were the second of two people that had done this trip before. And uh, we continued on and realized that we should probably not be in it as hard as we were. Uh, so it was kind of a reality check for the rest of us. And, uh, you know, Ian Ian took off to camp. He didn't look super excited to be... No, I wasn't happy. But uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, I got back but to how camp. But how did we fix that, by the way? How did we get you back to camp instead of just letting it sit there? Well, we... Because uh, it broke off. Yeah, uh, Ratchet's... Tight basically did a uh, how, how zip you, ties for zip, the win. Yeah. Just just for clarification, Ben is the one that trailside fixed this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as we were all standing around it, and I think he used a, uh, a tire iron or, I or used riches uh, Rich. breaker bar. Rich, Rich again to the rescue with the tools. Yeah. You're going to hear that a lot today. Using yeah. a breaker bar and a and a bunch of zip ties to zip tie the breaker bar to the to the. Control yeah, that breaker bar was a unique forty-five degree breaker bar. It was. Bar. It was like perfect. It was like meant to be that. on there. Yeah. So that was actually really, you know, perfect timing for that tool to pop out of the toolbox. So uh, you rode that back to camp. Yeah, no issue. Yeah. No issue. You know, it was cracked up pretty good. But uh, um, by the time I got back to oh, man, I'll bet you, I'll bet you by, I'll bet you by the time you guys got to Canada, Rich had already had one coming. Had a, a spare tie rod coming. Uh, huge shout out to Chris, his uh, his buddy, co-worker at Octane Toy Box and Sumner. Chris put it out there that we were looking for this component. And then all of a sudden, Florence Yamaha ste- stepped up. And Florence Yamaha has gotten, since then, has gotten a new nomenclature because they sell Polaris Yamaha and Can-Am. They sell everything now. But they had a 72-inch uh, A-arm for my car. I think they had one and an OEM one. Yep. OEM one. And they put it out overnight and just basically saved the week because at that point I would have been a taxi driver. Right. So they got it sent uh, to a uh, Wenatchee 
where where I met it and started wrenching away. But nonetheless, it took me out for about 36 hours. Yeah. So we continued on. And uh, Ben, you took us up north to towards the Canada border. Mm-hmm. And uh, the riding style out there, um, when we were closer to Conconally, was very rocky, a little bit bouncy, uh, a little bit switchbacky, uh, but nothing too tight, nothing too long. It was it was a nice mi- mix of, of straightaways and cut, cuts so that you never really get bored. And you would start popping out and seeing a little bit of the mountains and hit this here and there. And... Uh, but then we started getting up to the last, I don't know, 50 miles, 100 miles of that, or I guess it was 100 over, but the 20 miles, 30 miles, whatever. And it really started opening up and you could see some pretty vast stuff and uh, came out to some, some pretty awesome lookouts up there. Pretty spectacular. Yeah. And There's a reason we like this run. Yeah, it was it was really beautiful as you got, I mean... Anyone will tell you the further north you go, the more pretty it gets, right? But uh, just some of the unique geographical features where you're, you know, 2,500 feet up looking down into a valley and you can see, uh, what's that lake called over there? Palmer. Uh, Palmer Lake down to the left. You can see, you know, agriculture down in front of you. You can see, you know, the mountains separating down the middle up to the northeast. Well, you touched on it on the last podcast. You're basically going, you're going from rainforest to desert to high mountain to cascades, back to rainforest, and then all of a sudden you're in a, you're in the uh, uh, the Okanagan Valley. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, the Washington of all the of all the backcountry discovery routes, uh, rumor has it Washington is one of the most beautiful. So, right, we're gonna find out though. Yeah, we're gonna get our eyeballs on more trails. So, yeah. Uh, so that was a cool experience seeing that we stopped, took our time to get some footage and some pictures and, uh, just kind of soak that in a little bit and take a break from the, at that point, I think we had gone like 60 miles or something like that. Um, and then we went down the valley, right? We shot down into the valley and around the lake and, uh, headed up North a little bit further. Uh, how far away from the border were we at that point? Um, maybe a mile. Yeah. It wasn't too far after that. We, we just took the, the little highway there and, Jaunted up north and eventually got within eye eye range of the uh, the border station. Yeah, I think actually, f- sorry, from where you from where we stopped to just as we got to asphalt, it was probably five miles. I think is what it is. Yeah, and then we stopped about a mile away from the border. And the best part was that the other guys with us were all, "Why are we stopping?" You know, well, yeah. that little brown box right there. <laughs> yeah. That's the place that takes your things. Do you yeah. have your passport? No. Do you have guns on you? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to keep no, your guns? You're going no further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, it was about that point that they realized that uh, Ian snuck away with a cooler full of adult beverages. Yeah. There was no... Uh, and I don't feel sorry for any of you. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I took that in a little bit, kind of, kind of BS for a little bit and then headed back, um, at that point and started just basically backtracking the exact trail we just took all the way back to, to the farmhouse. Uh, so that was nice because we basically were able to shake down the cars, make sure everything worked, make sure, you know, uh, if anything was going to come loose, it was going to come loose at that point and, uh, have a good night's rest back at camp. And it didn't seem like anybody had any kind of hiccups past Ian's. Uh, nope. With gear load out or anything like that, everything seemed pretty tight, and yeah. certainly made me more confident, more comfortable with the preceding days. Now, did we ever run into anybody on that leg of the trail? I think we ran into one, one maybe two, but it yeah. Was, uh, uh, while I was uh, while we were heading up, we ran into Polaris General. Yeah, there was a general, yeah, right? There was a guy yeah. up there noodling around. Very common in the Conconnelly area, anyway. You know, yeah, it's kind and of he a wasn't like off road. Yeah, at speed. Capital he was just Washington. out enjoying the trail and right. Hey, Heidi Ho, and on his way. Yeah, I mean, he was he was coming right at me. You know, he was. I almost went. Head, I I didn't almost go head on with him, but he was in basically my lane when I pulled up next to him. He told me there was a massive sinkhole, and that's what he was doing was ducking it. And I gave you guys a radio call that to be on the lookout for that. But and he was right. That was pretty gnarly. <laughs> yeah. So that first leg of the trip, we all stayed pretty tight as well. Like uh, a lot of us ate a lot of dust. And on, on that part of the trail. But uh, it wasn't too bad. The weather was good. It looked like it might have started raining on us, but it never did. And uh, yeah, that was a really great scenic. If you if you want to go ride, you know, just like a little day trip and, and go for a, a, an experience that you can quickly kind of accomplish within one day and, and feel comfortable getting back home in time, I would highly recommend going to Conconoli into Canada and back. So I have to ask you a question. Knowing what you know about that leg, Ben and I have done it total four 
four loops somewhere in there, Something give like or that. take. Yeah. How much do you want to go back there for what you just said as a day trip? And because you saw all those offshoots, you saw all those offshoot trails that are not part of the main body of the BDR. They're just nothing but little finger trails. Yep. You want to take all of them. You like, want you want to try every single one of them. Every single one. You know. And they all have a little bit different yeah. topography and a different different approach and a different. They're you know. on different levels of being, you know, technicality. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's the type of thing where I'm I'm just literally trying to make my X3 just war ready bomb proof basically so that i have the utmost confidence just wheel the heck out of that thing so i was just pulling up my ipad here uh, that i used for navigation on the trail and uh that uh that leg of the trip had just over 5700 feet of elevation change yeah yeah so that was pretty pretty extreme seeing the different topography that comes along with that kind of elevation change and some of those points were pretty quickly accomplished like you're not yeah it's not that much over a long period of time you're not just going downhill or uphill the whole time it's there were some points where you were just going downhill fairly steep and you've got vantage points on that trail you've got vantage and not just that trail but the entire bdr you have vantage points of every mountain washington has to offer and that view coming into lake palmer on the south side of lake palmer when you drop down towards the night hawk border crossing it's one of my favorite views i've ever seen in my life like it's just you're overlooking orchards you're overlooking like vineyards and you're overlooking lake palmer and when you're that high up and you see lake palmer there's so much reflection of the overall terrain like like is that a lake you know it's it almost looks like a pond from that really perspective does. and that's a huge lake yeah and when you you guys drove around it like i would think that a lake like that would just be bombarded with recreation it must all be private land there's not a ton going on out there right you know there's a there's a maybe one or two camp spots obviously there's some homes that are kind of right up against it but you know when you're talking to your buddies at barbecues and stuff maybe basically people are talking about going to lake chelan going to the columbia river very few are talking about going to lake palmer and it's amazing yeah, it was. I that it gets the inner photography nerd in me excited to want to just go back there and hang out all day just mm-hmm. to capture the different light angles and the different perspectives and and all that because you know when you see like the National Geographic cover with like you know the vineyard at sunset and you know whatever like all those things just start popping into your head and you're like I could do that here like it gets you pretty excited yeah and if you have a drone that <laughs> you could probably waste through all your batteries within a couple hours just getting everything you'd want out of that well, place. if I if I'd have brought my laptop I'd show you the drone footage I got on it last year it's stunning yeah stunning so uh, that was day one for us was swapping springs breaking a arms, yep. hitting the border, coming back and uh, getting rest for the next day. Yeah. That night I actually took off. I, uh, I went home. Because you were gone I, before we came yep. back, right? No, I was there. I was there. Um, oh, he took off at what, about an hour after we got back. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember. I, no, I took off without my trailer. I yeah, left, you left uh, without yeah, your trailer. I left the can I it. left the trailer there. Uh, I took off the next day. My, uh, my rim showed up and my tire. So I just, got my Because you were going to end up heading done. back to Wenatchee. Well, the part was going to meet me in Wenatchee. Right. So I was just trying to get as much done as humanly possible. But I got to tell you, in terms of being uptight and just upset with that breakdown, I just found myself at the house the next day just pacing. Just <laughs> pacing. You know, you're just waiting for the UPS, man. You're waiting for anything, any notification that your parts are going to be there. And uh, first thing that popped up was those method reels about 11 o'clock. And I just started getting into action get yeah. them installed. And as soon as they were installed, I hit the road back to the farmhouse to pick up the car. Yep. Did you uh, put the tires on at the trailer or at New Wenatchee? I put them on at the trailer. Yeah. I put them on up in uh, Wenatchee. So. So. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, up in Conconnelly. Yeah. At the farmhouse. Yep. So uh, day two, we headed down south and um, the topography changed, but it didn't, it was the same, but it was different. Like, I don't know how to explain that. Do you have any way to explain that? Like, it, like you, in, this, going into Chelan? Like heading south from Conconoli, like the first, I don't know, third of that leg was a lot like the north leg, but it was different. Like, I don't know if it was it just you started getting more views of mountains or something? Well, it, you, more views of different mountains. And the the terrain changed just enough. The variety of trees changed just enough. The scrub changed just enough that that it's dissimilar enough to make it continue to make it interesting, but it's the same enough that you're, you're not like 
oh my god, we're in a completely different area. Right. And then obviously, as soon as we got out of the Conconelli area, we started running into cows and, and different types of animals out there that were grazing. Lots of uh, cattle guards crossings, things like that. Uh, and uh, it did get a little bit tighter right outside of Conconelli. And then we uh, we were in the valleys of the, of the hills and then we hit a water crossing. Uh, which was a little bit fun getting wet. Uh, nothing too serious or hard or complicated or anything yeah. like that. But. Yeah, so I, I hit those same trails coming back north. Right. But um, in reference to what it was like this year versus last year, between Conconelli and I want to say b- between Conconelli and about maybe 15 to 20 miles south of Highway 20, Ben and I were screaming on that trail last year, just flying. So they tore it up a bit. You know, they tore it up a bit south of uh, Conconelli, between Conconelli and Highway 20. It was a lot rougher this year. So I, I think they, t- uh, they took There was the, lots of rocks, yeah, lots yeah, of little sure. jagged edges popping that out. That wasn't the case last year. Last year, it was narrow, but it was smooth. And we were just flying on that, man. That was like, that was like Rally that Car Center. Cross- crossing. Me either. If it was there, it, it was just... just a might have been might have been seasonal. That's yeah. what I was gonna say because we went last uh, last year. We went six weeks later, or yeah, six weeks later than yeah. we did it this year. Yeah, and, and the weather doing what it's doing. I think there was water later than it right. has been in the past. Right. Yeah. So that first leg, we were in in the valley of the different mountains, and then eventually, uh, as we got further south, uh, we started opening up more and be more on the side of the mountains instead of in the valleys of the mountains. Uh, so we had gained elevation at that point, and we were cooling off a little bit. Um, and the weather held out great for us, never got too hot, but it definitely got more dusty at that point. Yeah. And, and so it spread us out a bit further at that point. It spread us out a bit further because we were all having some radio issues you know the frustrations with with the radios that we do, we started doing a lot more slinky on the trail right where you yeah. where one guy goes out and stops at the, at the turn and the next guy catches up and and so with all that dust there was just a lot of slinking going on on the trail and that slowed us down quite a bit but yeah. but i think that uh going into our next adventures we'll have better comms because there's just if you're trying to cover ground like the worst way you could do that is stopping yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. the The next run that we do, by and large, is a little. It's a lot longer, and there's less variation off the trail. That I mean, there's just less less left and rights. Whereas the Washington run, it's constant. Constant. I mean, you're, yeah, you're you're turning at least two to three times per hour. Yeah. yeah. And so that was one thing that I noticed up north was you had these little stretches where you would you would come around the corner and then you would you'd gun it for a little bit and then you would turn another corner. Uh, whereas as we're getting more south, I'm saying that we're we never get those stretches anymore. We're averaging, you know, less than 15 miles an hour over these turns because you just can't get up to speed on them. Um, and then there really were no kind of like obstacles or anything like that. It was just all trail noise, rocks, you know, washouts, things like that. It wasn't really ruddy, wasn't really nothing really complicated. Yeah, just a little bit of ruts here and there, but nothing nothing that would have really slowed us down much. We didn't really get into the ruts until the next day. I'll tell you what, though. I don't know how many moon pies I hit that ended up on my elbow from my arm hanging out the window. <laughs> Welcome to the BDR. I, I quickly learned that my arm needs to sit either slightly in from the door or just in my lap. <laughs> at, least, at, least, at least they didn't end up in your lap like Brian. Oh, my goodness. Did he get a big old chunk? Oh, that's horrible. But yeah. there was just points where you're just driving, and all of a sudden you're just like, what 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 what's going on <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're just covered in in manure so uh yeah if you're if you're in farm country and and uh, grazing country just understand that either you're going to dodge them or you're just going to keep your limbs inside and hope for the best <laughs> so as we got further down uh more uh down towards uh past twisp area and and starting to head into kind of that chelan county area you know, what was the difference as, that you noticed? Um, it seemed like we were running into a lot more people. You know, further think, south to Chelan, we started running into quite frequently people, yeah. Yeah, I think that I we ran into more people in just that one section than Ian and I ran into the entire run last year. You know, I bet you there was a dozen different vehicles that we ended up dodging. And, you know, we ended up slowing down even more just simply because they were not and there was some near misses involved with that. Nobody gets trail signals, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, you can it hold, was you funny. can a hold lot of the people five. We would sig- I, I would see everybody in our group being signaling and yeah. I'd be signaling and then they'd just be like, Hey, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like, they, what? Yeah. no, those, those things mean things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's almost to the point where the forest service needs to put up signs, you know, cause Oregon, Oregon has those signs out of the sand dunes on how to, how to flag people, how many people are in your group. And it's just, it, well, I would say that the majority of the people we saw outside of like a handful of adventure bikes we're just recreational people yeah. from the city. The adventure bike guys know what's up. Yeah. Like, and I, when you and flash they, them, they gave us signals. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the good riders do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other guys that are that are white knuckle on it, they're, they're going to hold on to those handlebars. But there was a lot of like day campers or day hikers or trucks that are and just hikers? like- hikers? Yeah. Where where were they parked? <laughs> <laughs> Did we come around the corner and there's two guys standing there, two older guys. Two I was old- like, holy cow, where did you guys come from? Yeah. Like- Guys that you were like, how did you even walk that far? Like, <laughs> But uh, yeah, we did run into a quite a bit more traffic once we got closer to Chelan. Um, and I, I did notice that there was the, tr- the, the, the road bed changed at that point where it started getting looser and more broken up. Like you couldn't take corners as fast and you couldn't take, you know, some of those things as quickly because you had to understand that you were either going to be turning or you're going to break loose. And so I, no- I did notice that my average speed went way down once we got closer to Chelan. It wasn't just because of people. Uh, I think it was getting drier, I think was the biggest. It was getting drier, a little bit more desert-like, for sure. Definitely a lot less trees. Yeah, I was going to say the driest portion is actually south of Chelan on the way to Kashmir. That was desolate, big time. Yeah, was. there was going through that burnout. Yeah. Oh, the burnout. That was, that was another thing that I noticed was like up north we were seeing burnouts, but they were all like – Freshly grown. They were reha- rehabilitating, right? Yeah. And then we, when we started going south further, we started seeing burnouts where it was like straight up like it was burnt like the summer before and it was still charred, right? Well, no, those weren't burned the summer for before. That was years ago that that burned. That was a few years ago during the big complex fire over there, right? Yeah. And uh, But it, it it's just amazing how you can go from recovery to no recovery almost within an hour, right? Um, and it's a different world looking through the trees – you know, on the mountain versus where you, before you were, you were kind of looking through the bushes and, and getting broken up and, and not knowing exactly where you were. But in this, all you're seeing is toothpicks out of the ground for miles and miles and miles. So kind, that, kind of lonely, kind of desolate, yeah. a little sad. Yeah, for sure. And I can only imagine what that was like during the experience. That would have been nuts. Yeah. And, th- and th- at that point, I was actually thinking, you know, at some point within the last couple of years, there was guys on this trail right now that I'm driving at speed and they were in fire trucks trying to figure out how to put these fires out and just kind of that thought process of uh what it actually takes to maintain our forests and 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 all that there's you know they're so underrated the guys that have to go out and take care of all this stuff um so big shout out to those forestry guys and and the firefighters that have to go out and dig those lines and that's that's no joke than what they do that's no and joke. gives you a better understanding of what the smoke jumpers what they're why they are doing what they are because there's just absolutely no way to get them in any other way right there's i mean you can look out over certain valleys and you're just thinking if something were to start fire right now like there's no stopping it until it gets to the city basically what you guys are touching on is kind of a thought process that literally goes through your mind when you're doing these bdrs you you get kind of absorbed into your own ride the daydreaming, your mind, your mind wanders. Like yeah. there's just so many miles and so many hours and just so much scenic stuff that when you're doing this stuff, you just start daydreaming. You know, it yeah. really becomes your own ride. Yeah, it's weird because, like up front where you guys were, a lot of times you can you can get lost in thought, but the further back in the group you go, like if you're a part of a group like we were, it becomes less and less likely that you're trailing off into thought. Like yeah. <laughs> they they come in which, and then which trail are they on? That was a branch. <laughs> was that the branch I needed, or was that? It basically yeah. becomes like the, as soon as you get distracted from your your concentration on on dodging things, uh, you find yourself in a dust cloud and you can't see nothing, and then you end up going up the side of a mountain like I did. So <laughs> there were a few times where I kind of let my thought process go, and I ended up either going off the trail down or up a mountain off the trail. That's thinking, happened to me. You know, yeah. I, I'm out there. I'm out there in front, and I've I've literally just not looked at my GPS for a mile, and then realized it's so, hey, dude, you're on the wrong trail. <laughs> and I'm like, how am I going to explain this to the guy? <laughs> <laughs> we planned that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we've all had those experiences where we get distracted from, from navigation or, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's so hard when you got the cascades starting to pop up and you're seeing all the snowy peaks that are still, you know, in July, 
beautiful. And, and then you realize that you have between you and them, just an awesome view. And then you have the trail you're on, which is awesome. Yeah. And you're going at speed and you got this powerhouse motor underneath you. And it, it's all a lot of stuff to kind of keep it, keep track of. So. And even with na- some navigation mistakes, you know, you pull over to correct the mistake. Rich, Rich was saying, every time I pulled over, Rich would just look at me and shake my, shake his head. He's just like, this is amazing. This is amazing. You know, he, he was so pumped on it. So it was just one of those things where as long as you're out there and enjoying it and seeing some stuff that under normal circumstances that you wouldn't get to see, it's just pure stoke. And the thing that I found once we got uh, just north of Chelan, where we were starting to see the Cascades just create, you know, epic views and, and horizons uh, was that I found myself keep slowing down just so I could get the view before the <coughs> obstacle. Whoa. <laughs> ben, Ben's taking out my chair over here. Took a while. I booby trapped um, that a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I found myself slowing down because I would see an opening in the rocks or the trees or whatever. And I would just let off the gas so that I could make sure I had enough time to absorb whatever was going to be in my view before the next obstacle came. Whereas earlier in the trip, the first part of the leg, it was like, just beeline it until it opens up. Right. Dude, how many times on that trail were you thinking to yourself, man, I hope the GoPro caught that. <laughs> it happens a lot. There's, there's a lot of that trail where like the GoPro, if you have it up on the side or whatever, the car, that just the wide angle perspective doesn't do justice to what you're seeing and the scale of what you're seeing. And that's where it's like inside of me, I'm thinking as the camera guy going, I wish I had time to just park, pull the cameras out, figure out the perspectives to show how much awesome is out here. Right. Yeah. So, and, and we're probably at some point or another going to have to do this run again in legs where we keep moving my trailer and we keep moving trucks to accommodate. So that way we go up and back, film the whole thing, take our time, then work on day two you know, film it up and back just to, uh, and I'm not saying that the whole mission would be to just capture a bunch of content, but if we're not in a rush, it's just going to be so much more enjoyable. And in this run, this run, it has everything. You want to wheel, you wheel, you want to rally, rally. You want to see amazing stuff. It's everywhere. You know, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. There's definitely uh, tons of places up there where it's like, I just wish we were camping here, <laughs> yeah. you know, with this lookout just for that experience because it was so cool. But uh, for sure, I would say that the average person looking for epic, epic memories would be that leg of the trail. Yeah. Like between Conconoli and Chelan, if you want the experience of sitting on the edge of a cliff and camping with the Cascades out there, Chelan Lake down there, and, you know, whatever over to the oh, east. Oh, dude. Rimrock. It, there's so much good Rim stuff rock. up there. <laughs> we need we need to get you a little farther south yeah. than when Oh, no, out. for sure. Like, we, yeah. there's plenty to see, right? There's there's so, that's that's the thing is like for every single person, they're going to have a different level of stoke yeah. on the different stuff. Uh, but uh, this, at this point in the ride, <clears throat> I was at that point like, okay, I'm ready for the rest of it. Let's, let's get it all in my eyeballs because I want to see yeah. it all. Yeah. And this, this ride was no different than the first ride as far as you didn't, you never woke up going, man, I got to, how many miles am I going to have to put on today? You're going to go like, what is today going to hold for us? Right. That was definitely the feeling Like you wake up like, oh, cool. I wonder what the next corner is going to look like. So, uh, if you ever get, um, trail fatigue, I know a lot of guys on bikes get trail fatigue where they're, they're just having to, you know, arm pump through corners and get, you know, to the, get to that POI or to that campsite or to the, the, the gas station or whatever. And it feels more like work. Whereas in a side by side, you have the luxury, especially if you're a passenger, right. To just kind of sit there and soak it all in. And, uh, that's and the best part is you can take a cooler and have beer with you too. Yeah. And that's why I don't have an adventure bike anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we got down to Chelan and, uh, we ended up taking a slightly different route than I think what was expected. Uh, we ended up going straight through the valley. I don't know what that that road was, but uh, we can pop it up on the screen. But uh, we ended up going through the valley, just kind of zigzagging down the valley to Chelan. No, that was that was the same route. Huh. We took a different route on the way back. Yeah, on the way back, I took them on a different. I took them on the uh, on the way back. I took them on a trail that you and I did the year before. It okay. was um, we almost went to Manson. Manson is a town adjacent to Chelan. We almost went to Manson before we started heading north, and uh, we were on a rough trail. No question about it. It's one of the roughest trails on the entire run, the one that I took them back on the way through. But uh, 
you know, I, it, it was so, it was so weird because we were driving that at night and the year prior I drove that same section at night and Ben and I left Chelan looking for a camp spot. We drove 20 to 30 miles going, dude, there's nowhere to pull off here. And then all of a sudden found one spot. And that was the one spot that I recognized when we were coming, coming back North. And, uh, so I knew we were good, but, yeah. but nonetheless, the Magellan doesn't lie. You know, if you, if you were on the, if you're on that route, you'll, yeah. you'll find your way. So we popped out, uh, off that road and ended up, uh, hitting into what highway is that? 20. So, oh, you're, are you talking out of Chelan? Yeah. So this is the leg we took right here and we popped out right here in, at that intersection on the highway, right across from a, some sort of like house of worship of some sort. And so we pulled into the parking lot just to kind of regroup and figure out what we were going to do next. And, uh, and then the four seater with the film crew, they kind of turned into the parking lot and all I heard was pop. pop. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I know that's an axle. And, uh, they weren't even doing anything. They were simply just pulling into the parking lot. And, uh, at that point I was like, I, I thought that was an axle, but no one's looking at it. So maybe it's good. Maybe it just bound and popped out or whatever. But then we made our way around the Chelan through through uh, Chelan to the north, and uh, started heading to back up into the hills, which there was a big change between just one side of the lake and the other side of the lake. Yeah. So we came up from the north side of the lake, and that was all dry, deserty stuff. And then as soon as we got out of the city, going south, it seemed like it just popped back into pine forest. So this is something worth mentioning as well. So uh, what we're looking at right now, uh, for those of you guys that aren't watching on YouTube. Um, we're looking at the route that was taken south and then the route that was taken north. The route that was taken north is was on my trail. The route that was taken south is in green, and that was where Ben led him. The the BDRs always evolve. The uh, the people that manage the site, the people that manage the route, they update it constantly. You know, they they update it based on uh, washout. They update it based on pace. They update it on a, on a number of factors. And I think that the GPX file that Ben uploaded into a system was an updated version because the the route that we took, which is here in Orange, was the BDR last year. You know, so it's it's kind of an interesting case study. You know, I. I I, I'm a firm believer, firm advocate that people take um, uh, more or less kind of venture off, explore this, that, and the other, save your trail, you know, because that way if this stuff does update, you're just going to go a different route, see something different potentially. But that's it's really cool that your, your system here, you know, my Magellan saved it as well, but uh, it is cool to kind of save these different points to get to the same locations and stuff. But it, it's it's really neat how they've updated this stuff. Yeah, and the, the thing about navigation, right, is to make sure you first, if you're going to go on a trail like this, make sure you have a solid understanding of how to use your system. Make sure that you've downloaded all the files that are related to the trip you're going to be taking, including any backup plans that go around what you're doing. So if you have to shoot off a trail, but there's no, there's no plan B except for 60 miles west or something, you're going to need to download 60 miles west as well, like just to be safe. And... Uh, and if you have the opportunity, like you said, to go back on the trails that you were already on and have that backtracking capability and being able to see that thing on the way out and, oh, that would be a cool trail to take, you know, when we have more time or, or on the way back or something, you can have the ability to do that because you're watching your steps be retraced and you're able to then take a little bit more fun trail on the way back or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, so we, we went through Chelan, cut around, headed up, um, looks like that's Highway 971, uh, and then it hit the, uh, hit the mountains. Was that uh, one of the most longest amount of times that you've spent on pavement in a side by side? Uh, it's a chunk. That was the longest period where I was thinking, I hope I don't see a cop. Yeah. <laughs> and then we passed one and he waved and as the cop we waved drove by. Well, no, he parked his car and turned his car off and waved. <laughs> and all of us, everybody in the trail was like, oh, God, he saw us. <laughs> Don't notice it. Don't notice us. Wave. Oh my God. I got, we got yeah. through with that. Now it turns out that, and you know, don't take our word as your judgment on how no, to handle your next trip, not. but it seems like it was kind of like a okay thing, well, but I don't think it's technically legal. Well, I've looked so. at all the legalities and Chelan Co County is pretty accommodating to side-by-sides and you know, we weren't the only one on the road. We weren't the only side-by-side -side on the road and we've seen a lot of cops and they're always pretty cool. I'm not saying that they would be cool if they saw a caravan of 20 side-by-sides going down the or highway. Or a guy just being a prick on the road. Something. Yeah. I, I think that's the takeaway from that situation is the fact that we were following local laws. We were not being hooligans. 
we were we were doing everything we could in order to be the good stewards that we are. And we and we made sure that we had our signals, we had our 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 chase bars flashing. Like there was no way that you couldn't know we were there and and end up in a bad spot. So, um, but uh, like I said, so once we got out of town and into the forest again, it like instantly changed back to pine forest, which I thought was really interesting. Like the elevation change wasn't that big, but it just the topography just changed from one side of the lake to the other. So that was pretty interesting. And then uh, right after we hit the forest, we had a breakdown. So we had our first uh, official axle blow uh, to where it would just quit. And I, from the story I got, Rich was saying that that axle was uh, basically original to the car. And so it had been a while since it had been even pulled out, let alone refreshed. And they ha- they had a lot of weight on the car as well. And it was only in two-wheel drive. So that's a lot of stress on the rear. You know, they yeah. um, we had a little issue with the the front diff and uh so they were kind of relegated to, to two-wheel drive and so that car did not get its front diff fixed yeah. in time for the trip and yeah. was running full two-wheel the whole way and uh so that was the four-seater uh it was a 1000 uh, polaris razor that had been supercharged and so it had remote rad had a whole bunch of different upgrades on it so it's a super cool car because it's tons of power tons of torque and uh had some big tires on it i think it had some 30 32 32s car- carnivores yeah. um but uh big car big cage uh, made by al Macbeth and his crew up there up north the and the cage on the four seater i'm not sure who made that it was, al. It was, al. was it al because yep. yeah. i know on the pro it's al yeah al builds the cage on the pro, only so. takes his stuff to al he says fair enough yep. yeah. and uh he was pretty excited about how awesome that turned out dude al, al's looks great. work is unreal <laughs> yeah so if you haven't checked out al Macbeth, not only is he uh the superman of utvs yeah uh but he also has a, uh, an amazing fab shop and doesn't take shortcuts in any any kind of way so um but anyways that car it was then loaded up with the two filmers from revma and then they had all their equipment because they also had their equipment from not only the shoot we were doing on the trail but also the next shoot that they were doing in idaho after that so they had quite a bit of gear in the car it was it was it was weighed down pretty good and uh just just snapped an old axle. Well, just Bam happens. Bam's on the gas too, so I'm sure yeah. that probably played a role. <laughs> his uh, his sandal was pushing pretty hard. For sure. Um, and uh, so we stopped at a campsite that just lo and behold ended up being our campsite for the night, uh, which was, I don't know how much more perfect of a spot you could have broken down at, had Fantastic. bathroom and cover and all that sort of stuff. You so. guys are spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was It was, it was a campsite. Dope. Like if I was taking the family out, I'd be like, yeah, this is a good campsite. Yeah. So They'd, It had bed, it had sand beds for you to put your tent on and it, it, was, it was great. dialed in. And yeah. And I uh, didn't have any coverage for the, the, the phones or the, I think the GPS barely had uh, signal there or something like that yeah. uh, for the the spot that Rich was using, uh, but uh, at that point we had we had fallen back because we were in the I was in the back the filmers were in the middle uh, Rich was in the back, so uh, Ben you had already taken off up the hill. I was leading. <laughs> I was up on top of the hill and I'd gotten to a Y and I was sitting there going, hmm. I don't think they're that far behind me because I was yeah. there for probably 20, 25 minutes. Unfortunately, I had just a smidgen of cell reception, and I was actually talking with Ian, and uh, he was in conversation with, with Rich and ended up getting me turned around, and I got back down. Yeah, and I was like, I'm in Wenatchee. I don't know where the hell you are. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I actually went up the hill at, at a Y. I went down both ends of it and got two points where I was like, Okay, I'm really far out here. So either Ben's not down this trail or he's really far away. <laughs> I was really far away. I was hauling balls. They, they told me that uh, you were 20 minutes out. From, it it yeah. took a while for him to get back for yeah. sure. Yeah. And uh, there was a little glimmer of a radio pop. And I think that was base camp. I don't think it was Ben. But I decided at that point, it was like, okay eventually Ben will figure out that no one's behind him and he'll head back. Either that so. or he's just going to camp out there and we'll catch up to <laughs> we'll him some catch point. Him. We'll find him somewhere. <laughs> yeah. and uh, Or he'll be on the news. One of the two. So <laughs> um, so we, we just hung back at camp and, uh, you know, waited for Ben to show up. He, lo and behold, comes flying down the trail and, and uh, we set up camp. And uh, that was the first night that I actually hammock camped. And I think I'm going to be doing that on the Idaho run. So uh, that was pretty comfy. Uh, that was cool. We got to camp under the pines and and stage for the next day. So, what was our plan? What what ended up happening? We, uh, I think Rich contacted somebody. We had a friend, Rich, Rich North, Northwest had UTV a friend. Yeah, Tracy Parkhurst. 
Okay. Yeah, Tracy was in the area. He was in the Chelan area for vacationing, and he had a he had an extra one. And Tracy's legit. He's a he's a local racer. Awesome dude. I've 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 wheeled with him once out in, in Moses Lake, and he and his crew they they get after it. That was you know, I'm sidebarring here, but that was so, they're a fun group to ride with. And uh, Tracy saved the day. But Solid it's all guy. You know, it's such a testament to to how good of a guy Rich is that he's got this network of just so many people that are ready to help. And you know, we have that network too. You know, it's just uh, those you're talking about people that do go through so many leaps and bounds to make it happen for you. It's, uh, and it's I a comforting speak, I feeling. I think that speaks to the overall community at large for the most part. There's there's some some tail off groups that we would probably say don't have this motto, yeah. but pretty much the UTV group in general wants to help. Like, yeah, I, I'm I'm part of a couple different pages, uh, Washington Off Road Recovery, and uh, I think Idaho as well. And it's just it basically it's a page for people that are in trouble, and you'll see it about four or five times a year. Somebody will get stuck, somebody will get stranded. They'll put it on there, and guys are literally fighting over each other to help. You know, it's it's good, good, yeah, and, good and, to have people. You know, um, that continues into the forest maintenance too. There's multiple different trail associations and, and clubs that do trail maintenance and all that. And if you're not a part of one of those, we highly encourage you to, you know, seek them out and see who's in your area and how you can help because the forestry service, basically, if they don't have to do work, they're not going to do it. And especially if, in Washington, and especially in Washington. And if you're out there contributing to the work that they have to do, it just looks negatively on our sport. Right. But if you're out there actively being a part of that community and, and helping uh, to maintain these things that we all enjoy so much, then it just speaks so much better towards our community, towards the experience and the, and the states and the governments and the counties will all look look positive on that. And it's going to help us when we're asking for more rights. For sure. More access. Or when we're just simply trying to defend our rights. For sure. And uh, that's becoming under attack more and more nowadays. So uh, highly encourage you to just kind of seek what's in your area, see w- w- who's the local group, who you can get behind, yeah. and what pages you can follow just so that you're informed. You're and wearing a t-shirt of the best group in the Pacific Northwest. Got the... Yeah. I mean, there Northwest is, UTV yeah, represent. I mean, it's one of those things. If you have cell service and you're in a pickle and you put it up on that page, help's coming. It doesn't hurt that there's also like 10,000 members. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we ended up getting that axle delivered to us, basically. Uh, they just drove up from Chelan and kind of like Ubered Saved us an axle and uh, put when we just we put the machine up on, an, on a tilt. And, you know, and just for the record, when that axle went out, um, Rich is on an Iridium satellite network and he can he can text me whether or not he has cell service or not and when that went out i started to kind of play middleman to try and source the part five people volunteered to help in the wenatchee area you know five five people were working in real time to get him back on trail so it's just a testament to the community it's awesome yep i and and just uh you know we never really felt uh in any way that you know rich held us back or did anything he was always just more of a positive Let's fix it. Let's think good. Let's get this taken care of and get back on the trail. So that was just a really awesome experience to be with such a good group of of guys. So I didn't know him very well before this ride, and I absolutely would not hesitate to go ride with him at any point. Yep. I don't care what it is. Or just talk with him. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) We got some great stories. So Rich Uh, is stoked. (laughs) And if you're watching, Rich, I'm still looking for the purple butterflies. (laughs) (laughs) So to call that out real quick, uh, he's he's part of the the sponsorship for the Dravet. Is it Dravet Dravet Syndrome? Dravet. Yeah, Dravet Foundation. Yeah, his son has uh, has it. And um, it's a really unfortunate thing where uh, the child has to grow up having seizures at random points. Uh, Yeah whenever yeah. it just wants to pop its head out and uh they're looking for a cure they're trying they're doing experimental stuff and um just a big shout out to that family their kids are so sweet and so adventurous and um you know just a great a great family and and it's, so it's hard to one another yeah. yeah and it's hard to watch you know them have to to take care of that situation on a constant basis with no breaks and uh you know getting out and, and being able to ride your side by side is one of those things where a lot of us do have these life challenges where we have to kind of face them day to day and being able to just drive and just look at the scenery and just absorb it just really is one of the few things we can do to kind of keep our sanity. And uh, so just shout out to to them. Look uh, forward to links to um, how you can support that effort uh, down below. We'll put we'll put links up. And uh, if you could buy some uh, purple butterflies for your car, as uh, Ben's doing, um, all that money just goes to trying to help find a cure for this uh, unfortunate thing. So we uh, got the axle in. 
and uh, started heading south further. So um, at this point, we were trying to basically meet up with Ian in, in Wenatchee, right? Yep. And uh, you guys were trying to meet up with Applebee's. You didn't care about me. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brian had a, uh, yeah. a desire and a thirst within his soul to For find sure. uh, civilization he and a sit down restaurant. And he wanted a hamburger. <laughs> Hot dogs. Uh, hot dogs. Hot, uh, <laughs> had to hear about that. So there's an inside story on hot <laughs> yeah. dogs, and uh, that may come out one day or not. But uh, yeah, so we kind of did a beeline down the down the trail towards Wenatchee, and uh, that t- topography was interesting in that it kind of Get, that's where it gets ready. Yeah, it started breaking up a bit, and started having more of those speed bumps, the speed cuts that they put into the trails, which more or less just turn into you know challenges of how far you can jump them, but, uh, yeah, I took a, so, oh, some of this, it is more challenging than <laughs> others. <laughs> no, you're talking about the section between Kashmir and Wenatchee then. Oh no, there was some no. up there too. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was enough to where, you know, I had to, I had to physically stop the car. Zach, you need to slow down. You are way too top heavy and have no suspension when you're sagging this low. So, um, I bought him out a, a good couple times that, yeah. that reminded me. Yeah. Sounds like a good time. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> uh, but it got more broken up, more, it, even more dusty, I think, than some of the other spots. And, uh, it was super dry. And there was like no wind through those wind, through those little valleys. So, like, it would just hang there. And so you'd come through a pocket where you're like, oh, I can see. Like, I'm far enough back now. I can actually get some speed. And then all of a sudden you're into a cloud that you can't see the dash in front of you. And, um, so, so there was there was a lot of okay slow down just take it easy check check your phone take some pictures whatever while while the dust settles and uh so that got that got pretty interesting um halfway down that trail and then once we got down a little bit further um yeah it started to kind of clean up and became more of a road a road story um anything else from that section that you remember nothing that stands out yeah, Cash, you know the 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 trail between Kashmir and Wenatchee is pretty easy relatively wide a lot of blind corners which i know you love um <laughs> but once you get out of the basin because you're basically running along with this creek bottom you start to go uphill into the south end of wenatchee and then you drop into wenatchee that's one of the fun and, and it was funny because rich actually brought it up to me when i when uh, i met up with you guys he was saying how fun that actual section of the trail is and i i totally get it you've got a cool hill climb with a bunch of cattywamps that you can jump uphill and, uh, yeah. Good yeah. Time. So we went through Kashmir and that town was a pretty cool little town. Like if I was to be Kashmir driving so through, rad. if I was to be able yeah. to drive through town or whatever, like I would have stopped and walked around because it's a cool little town. Yeah. Kashmir and Leavenworth have this Bavarian vibe to them and especially Leavenworth. Leavenworth is a Bavarian town and like a, basically like a ski resort. Right. Um, but Kashmir kind of takes on that identity a little bit too. So it's, uh, it's definitely a is, uh, tourist Kashmir attraction. Is where they had the... The, like the little treat boxes and stuff. Yeah, Apple Fest type thing going yeah. on there. Yeah, yeah. So I'd I'd like to go down there and, and check it out. Yeah. Um, but uh, we took a beeline straight south off of the Kashmir area, and then we took this like hard east turn, and that's where things got interesting for me. Where it was like, okay, there's like some sort of like mountain bike vibe on the trail system here. And you can literally just jump after jump after jump on the trail system. If it's clear and safe to do so, Yeah, um, you could probably have a lot of fun uh, out in that area. So, And it wasn't broken up. It was all like well-maintained and, and a good time. It had some good canopy cover on it. And so it, just, it was a good time in that area. It's awfully dusty in there, but... It can be, but it, it seemed like it was not so bad when we went through. Maybe yeah, it had rain or something. movement in there and it was... Yeah. It was, cleared out so that little section between cashmere and wenatchee was pretty cool and i would su- i would say if you're looking for a more laid back kind of tra- trail ride there's some good riding back there um and then if you want to get if you want to get a little hairy there's some there's some trails out there to do that so we met up with uh ian at uh battery systems is that yeah. where we yeah battery systems in wenatchee that's where we had the a-arm scent yeah and it showed up about 11 um I think I probably could have met you guys in Kashmir had my phone stopped ringing. It was just, it was an incredibly busy day. I was Funny thing to, happens when you get to yeah. civili- civil- civilization. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you get called upon to do work. <laughs> it was, it was probably a solid four hours. Yeah. At, uh, between eight in the morning to probably about two when you guys, I think you guys got there maybe. It was, when you guys got there, it was actually close to five. And I, you know, the park came in at 11. I had to move around a little bit to get a tool. I had to press a, press a, uh, uh, the ball joint in. And it was a situation where all in, it probably could have taken about two hours 
but it uh, just wound up taking forever. But because you're out of town and well, my phone just wouldn't wouldn't shut up. So yeah. and no big deal. I was help, help. Well, what it was, I was helping coordinate. Uh, I was help. I was helping coordinate uh, a ride for an acquaintance. It was. Uh, tons of works related type stuff which technically i was kind of on vacation but nonetheless i mean but you guys made it and uh i think you guys caught the tail end about the last 30 40 minutes of you were just buttoning it up i was buttoning it up at the time and uh we wound up taking quite a bit extra time around the wenatchee area after it was all buttoned up you know i was kind of wheeling the car around town a little bit getting confidence back in it it was going to hold up and right so you had replaced the arm which requires you taking the whole front of the car apart yeah uh on the on the x3 rc yeah and on the you know on that arm it's one of those ones that you remove it going forward so you pull it towards the front of the car to get it to release and uh, the skid plate was in the way there's Kind of a number of factors that the you have winds, to take the in. The wind, the bulkhead, yeah. the skid plate, all of it. It's yeah. kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah, and you have to take you have to take both a arms loose because there's like these uh, little little bushing, little protector things that are that are kind of like they're strapped from one am to the other. So right, you have to take both. Clips. Yeah. If I if I could do it over again and give anybody any and any advice, what I would do is I'd definitely either remove the shock or pull the bottom of the shock loose and then just zip tie it out of the way or something. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't, because I actually use a Sawzall on the arm itself and just cut the arm right off because it was in the way, it was blocking itself going from the skid, pl- or yeah, the skid play was in the way. Right. So I just ripped the whole thing off. But nonetheless, we got her done. And at, you also got the 32s, uh, Max's Liberties put on with the method wheels. Yeah, it was supposed to be a surprise, but it was like the first thing Bam Bam said as soon as he showed up. He goes, dude, that thing looks so much tougher. <laughs> yeah. Well, the methods are just that classic beefy wheel. Yeah, they're sick. So, And then the Max's Liberties are that classic light truck, yeah. aggressive tread. So, I mean, it's just, a, it's just a classic beefy look. I think I probably added seven pounds per corner, you know give or take. Yeah. So, and you feel that, you know, I can feel that. I, I, th- I definitely think I need a little bit of clutch work. You know, I was driving the car last night and just raising hell with that thing. And, uh, it doesn't feel like as the zip, you know, right. there's more rotating mass to it. And yep. so, and I can't have that period. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're probably going to need yeah. a, a higher load spring and yep. some weights. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, but it was good to rejoin you guys as, as much as, as much as I, uh, uh, kind of let it take me out of the game a little bit mentally just being ticked off about the fact that the car failed it was uh you guys were a sight for sore eyes you know? <laughs> we well at that point we were just kind of running around trying to you figure out how we're gonna get you get guys to were t- tired yeah. too you know so yeah so um so we hit up a an applebee's and while we were there and hit the store and albertson's to grab supplies and some water and stuff. And that's one thing that a lot of guys don't really um, have a lot of experience with planning for these trips is if you can at all plan on just buying what you need along the way, instead of just packing every single thing that you're thinking you're going to need, you're going to say, save a lot of headache. You're going to save, you know, your, your, your mass and momentum is going to, is going to be improved. Yeah. Your braking's not going to be as hard. Your, I mean, all those things come into play on your car's wear and tear when you're doing hundreds of miles at a time. Yeah. And with, with COVID, what's going on with COVID and stuff, it's almost like you're darned if you do, darned if you don't. Cause as we're making plans for this Idaho trip, we're going to these small little mining towns that mining camps that maybe the store is open, maybe it isn't. And in some instances we're seeing that it's closed and, you know, Washington, if there's one thing I could say about Washington, there's none of that. There's resources everywhere, you know. Yeah. yeah. Including cell service on most yeah. of the peaks. A lot of, so lot of cell service. If yeah. you can get to the top where you can see away from you, you can pretty much have cell service. Now, unfortunately, Idaho, Jimmy John's and Domino's don't deliver out there, but they are know, not freaky fast. No, they are not. <laughs> so, uh, so we headed, so we ended up going south just to find basically a campsite. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. Um, and we ended up going to a meadow, uh, I think, to to camp overnight, which ended up being a horse uh, site where there was like it's set up to be camping for horses. Uh, we just didn't see them until the next day. <laughs> well, a couple of the, uh, I think it was Rich and Rich and Brian had stated that that was about the roughest trail that we saw on the entire trip. And I made sure to point out the fact that there were trucks and RVs camped behind us. So they obviously made it through it. Oh, well, they you know, came, they, the they came from the south, but nonetheless, <laughs> I mean, they're still seeing some pretty rough terrain. But yeah, yeah it, it, I could only imagine towing an RV into that stuff. That'd be some slow going. 
It would That's be. That's for sure. Well, uh, coming coming from the north like that, an RV's not going to make it through the couple of washouts that we ran into. So that was probably the most complicated Maybe. that we hit <laughs> <laughs> along the way was was that those couple of washouts. And, and the trail definitely got more windy. Like there was no averaging over 10 miles an hour at that point. I cannot confirm nor deny that I caught air coming out of that washout. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, there was a couple of washouts that, that had definitely a big dip in them, and, and yeah. coming out of that probably was a little bit more fun for others than it was for me. But well, Rich and I were flying, and uh, like I pulled over at one point, and Rich would just looked at me, and goes, "Dude, you are holding a break things pace." I'm yeah. like, "All right." I basically <laughs> told him, "I'm like, I'm back in the game, though, man. I need to get some confidence in my car again." And uh, but no, he was telling me, he "Goes, oh, I'm having a blast." Yeah. If, if there's one thing I can tell you, you know. The the Facebook forums are kind of all over the place on all of these rigs. You hear people say stuff like, oh, there's pros and cons about all that stuff. Could you be more impressed with that, that Pro XP? That I thing have, owned that trail. Oh, absolutely. it never even broke a sweat. Oh. And the, the thing that I keep constantly hearing about guys that take the Pro on – on trails or trips or anything aggressive outside of just a normal like trail ride or day at the dunes is how capable it is to navigate. Yeah. And uh, part of that is turning radius and ratio. Part of that is just how uh, more low center of gravity it has uh, compared to previous versions of razors um, and how much room you have in the cab that you don't feel like you're constantly being bounced into the door and things like that. Um, and then just the overall package, the wheelbase and all that is just a recipe for success. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we've been looking at the next version of the Razor Pro coming out here soon. And um, for all the people that say it's a pile of garbage and they, they miss they the mark. I don't know what they're talking about. I think that they're doing a lot of Facebook jockeying. Yep. And uh, I Brand think, honking. I think they just need to get behind the wheel. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like buyer's insecurity. You know, yep. they need their car to be the best car out there. And all I can tell you right now is wheeling with Rich and him and that, uh, that XP Pro, the way that he had, he set it up, the way that Al built that cage, there's nothing that, there's, there's nothing I could think of that would improve on that. I mean, he's going to keep making it more and more awesome. Like, I'll bet he probably does something with the stock suspension, stock A-arms. Because he was um, fully stock suspension on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure over the course of the next few years and stuff, he's going to upgrade some of those components. But, like, you know, he's got an HD7 Lowrance, um GPS in that thing. He's got a perpetual rear view, you know, backup camera that's, li that's live all the time. Yep. He's got... Uh, I've never sat in a more, you know, a more comfortable sport machine. You know, the, the riding position in that car is so much different than a, than a X3. Um, well, more, let's clarify that. It's different it, in the way it was set up because it has the flexibility to be exactly like an X3 it's, if you want it to be. It's literally like uh, my X3 feels like sitting in like a 300ZX or a Toyota Supra, meaning it's low and your feet are stretched out. His is like sitting in my F-150. And well, I don't mean that bad. Like it's it's not doesn't. I mean that insinuates that it could be top heavy. There's nothing about that car that feels top heavy. Right. Yeah. It was. But it's just so sick. The seats on that do have quite a bit of flexibility yeah. in how it positions, and it, you can be the super laid back driver down low, or you can be the really upright straight driver yeah. too. So uh, they did a good job on that. Um, yeah. Rich, that whole Rich was system. driving that thing. I drove that thing. Uh, Bam Bam drove that thing. Like Bam Bam was pumped on that car i've never seen anybody get out of driving one of those without a smile on their yeah. face no i could see that so uh so we camped at the campground uh honey meadows it's a it's a horse camp and uh gorgeous uh just a beautiful meadow to kind of look at and the trees were a little bit uh <laughs> unsettling at first because of the wind but uh we didn't have any problems and well one thing to mention too is is we tackled this at the end of june and the year prior ben and i did it in the second second first second week of august and we hit some cold temperatures throughout this this trip like uh that night uh at that particular meadow it was chilly man it was very cold it was it was an open area too yeah. like we just happened to stop at the end of the tree line you know and then it all opened up into these different yeah. meadows and open areas so the, the wind was coming through and, and taking any kind of that heat energy out yeah um and you definitely like when you're setting up camp at these kind of uh basically remote campsites with no services it's always a good thing to look up look up for stuff that might break off and come yep. down and hit your tent and uh, more often than not you'll end up sit, setting up camp right next to a deadfall so you gotta be. you gotta yeah. be careful definitely gotta be careful especially that, with going in northwest forests where there's co it's common to have burnouts and things where trees become 
damaged, uh, whether you see Very it on the common. outside or not. I saw we were going through one of the trails. There was a massive pine tree that from the outside, for all intents and purposes, looked perfectly healthy. But as you came around the corner, you saw that it opened up on one side and it was completely burned out from the inside. And so, you know, fires don't just happen on the outside of, of plants. They, they actually will grow or the fire will burn through the inside as well. So depending on how much rot or how much age it has, things like that. I was totally surprised by that, like coming on from one side, being totally healthy, going around the back. Oh, that $5,000 or 5,000 pound log could be on top of my car if, you know, the wind pushed correctly. So, um, so yeah, so we had a good night camping. We woke up, we all kind of cleaned up a little bit and decided that it was time to head back. Uh, our, we had a tight schedule, tight five days to get kind of as far down south as we could go and then start heading back to camp. So yeah, that kind of got open ended. You know, we were just throwing it out there, like what you know, what are some of the goals from a, a content capturing standpoint? Where are we, and uh, how long is it going to take us to get back? And so we started heading north, anticipating camping on trail again, then getting back to the farmhouse and doing some shooting around Conconnelly. But what we didn't realize is that we were going the whole way back that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we had taken three uh, three days to get you know south of of Wenatchee and then Chad rejoined the group and <laughs> well and then we ended up you know once we got back to to the Chelan area Chelan yeah Chelan we discovered that or right before Chelan we discovered that the boot on that replacement axle on the XP4 1000 decided that it also wanted to to end its life that was was that south of Chelan or was it just a little bit north of Chelan that that that, no, it was south. It was south. It was south. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, because we were on uh, on trail coming down. We were in Ardenvore when yeah. it got taken out, and then we we stopped by a creek and realized yep. that we had a problem. Yeah, and uh, basically what happened was we we replaced an old axle with an old axle, and uh, when axles don't move and don't get used, the boots start to degrade a little bit, and uh, especially when it's been used for hard miles, right. And uh, the just the the seam on the boot decided to give up, yeah. and spit spit its uh, guts all over the side of the machine for a second time. Yeah, the year prior, heading back to Chelan, Ben and I took a di- uh, a diverted trail that wound up being gated closed. And this year, I don't know if I think I actually told Ben about this. We found one. We found one where we got onto a highway and probably shaved off an hour and a half off that trail to get back to Chelan to where we could. Uh, look at some resources. Yeah. So then, uh, we were left in Chelan. We stopped by a, a gas station, a Safeway gas station, got some, some dinner and whatnot from there and, uh, had to kind of make a choice what we were going to do, uh, regarding this axle. Cause yeah. we'd already used our resource for an axle. Uh, and then unfortunately, <laughs> this is, this is the point of the trip where, I mean, I, we've always talked about it, how the Washington BDR absolutely will take a pint of blood out of you. This is where it really went overboard. <laughs> yeah. It kind of it kind of stuck yeah. it in and twisted. Just on a lot one. of bad luck. And you know? uh, we were, you know, getting uh, resources out of the store and whatnot, and kind of taking turns going in to not leave the cars by themselves. And, uh, and unfortunately, Rich lost his phone on that that part of the trip. And we spent a good, healthy amount of time trying to f- find where that went. And we're pretty sure somebody snagged his, it from him. His brand new phone. His brand new iPhone. Um, pretty sure it got set down on something for a moment and. Somebody saw an opportunity and, and swiped it. So, uh, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, the grocery store wasn't really much help in trying to find it or track it down either. So, yeah. Um, so that that part of the trip then became uh, in conjunction with the boot. Yeah, we had we had a, a, an exposed axle. We had a missing phone, which was a very important tool for that person, Rich. Um, and luckily, he had his eye, his uh, his Apple Watch, which was able to have uh, cell phone service, so he yeah. was still able to get out to the to the family. Um, because you know, like we talked about with his son and everything, being in communication is a constant priority for him. So, um, at that point, we were kind of left: do we push this car down the road? Do we, you know, hopefully? Because I mean, we didn't mention the fact that once we figured out the problem. We had tried to do a trailside repair, repair with simply just creating our own boot with a Ziploc bag and zip ties, which actually did, did, did hold, well. yeah. did did fine. Yep. Uh, but unfortunately, just the way that the you know the cup design and everything, it's just there was no way to keep the bag over the cup, and so it just kind of kept coming off with all the grease uh, and, that was. And in prior there. to that happening, we were having a fantastic day. 
Yeah. But, but like when we were shot south of Chelan, we were having a great day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, they were getting some great drone footage. Um, it was, I mean, I, you know, they know how to keep footage from being blown out. It was super sunny, great weather, you know, it was super dusty, but that's in that desert section between Kashmir and Chelan. And, uh, you know, by and large, we just, we were just killing it. So we had to either push it down the trail and potentially have a broken axle in the middle of nowhere where no one was going to bring us an sure. axle. Or think about options of maybe camping that car overnight and then coming back for it. Yeah. So we were in Chelan and when that happened, and then the greatest possible thing happened for Brian and Bam Bam. They decided to park the car, stay with the car, and get a hotel room, <laughs> <laughs> to, to which I found out the next day was like the greatest. They, they were pretty stoked on yeah. that one. I think, Bam, I think Bam Bam said he took something like two to four showers, give or take. <laughs> well, I so, heard that the, the water never went clear. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So we, 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 we ate a dirty. lot of dust oh on this trip. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. If you didn't have a pumper and a closed faced helmet, you were... You AKA were dirty. me. Yeah, you were dirty. <laughs> you were fairly dirty and holding yourself for pretty far back from for the sure. group. So for sure. Uh, so yeah, we decided to let the guys chill out in the hotel overnight, and uh, we decided to beeline it to camp another two hundred miles north at ten o'clock at night. At ten o'clock at That's night. That's when that decision got made. Yeah. So we had already done a hundred some odd miles. Yeah. And uh, decided to just kind of close the loop at that point, and uh, just hit the trail hard and and fast and tried to not uh, fly off cliffs and yeah the thing about driving at night you get so tunnel visioned on on what you're seeing uh sometimes you can lose perspective and then all of a sudden you're overshooting that corner or or whatever so yeah we were at uh, correct me if i'm wrong i want to say it was about i think my gps said 113 miles from chelan to the farmhouse give or take or Conconoli, one of those two is what it was going to uh, what it was going to be and we took off at uh, 10 o'clock at night and pulled it off. Yeah, so we we hit the trail, and uh, I don't know about you guys, but at, I actually enjoy night riding as long as I can Love have it. some sort of like perspective. Like we we've done ri- night rides over in like Fourth of July Pass in Idaho, and where you're you're riding the trail, but you can see the highway down there, and you can see the little towns pop up and all that. Like that's cool to me. Like I can see things and I can see perspective but when you're in a like this tunnel thing where you can only see the the white dust because you have your bright lights on and and you're dodging in and out of like blurriness because of the dust like it, it gets a little fatiguing like you can yeah. seriously have yeah. some 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 issues there yeah so you're familiar with my setup I run a switch pro unit with uh, Ba designs 10 inch bar and an LP4 setup on my bumper and uh, just couldn't and you're running a rigid setup and Rich is running a rigid setup it's awfully fun to test that, you know, to see what you're dealing with, see what you like, see what you don't like, see where you want to make some adjustments. I couldn't have been happier with my setup. I was so, so with pumped. this trip, um, I installed a Razor back off-road complete package on the Razor. We did full windshield, roof, rear windshield, cage, and all that. And I encourage you uh, to stay uh, subscribed to the channel, things like that, because we're going to do a full review of that uh, system. But uh, one thing that it did for us was it forced us to put the light bars up on top of the roof because there were, you're you're closing off with that front windshield you don't have the option of your a pillar stuff that you normally would have uh but we put the cubes next to the light bar at like 40 degree 35 degree angles uh to hit corners as you're going around corners and i was stoked to kind of see how that would perform because i've always had them at the lower a pillar position and i really liked it up there nice. i thought it did a great job nice. um and if you have like maybe a cube that has a spot and flood combo i can really see how that would benefit being up that high and being able to get over the bushes so that you can see like the trail on the other side of the bush on the corner it really did make a difference for me personally on on how i drove at night yeah lighting is so critical like there's a term in racing that's outrunning your light and uh I mean, if we were ever going to outrun our light, it would have been on that night. I can tell you right now, we left Chelan just about 10 10 o'clock at night, and we pulled into the farmhouse uh, 113, 114 miles later, four hours almost to the nose, four hours later. We came in almost exactly at 2 o'clock. So when I was starting to do the math, we we held a better better part of about a 28-mile-per-hour average on the way back. Uh, By the way, the whole entire trip, we never averaged over 20 miles an hour. Yeah. So like we took that that trip back was almost double pace than what we had done and going south. We we got off we were we weren't on the same page because you guys had come in 
for on a different route, and yep. I and I left on a route that you guys weren't familiar with. Right. We lost comms and uh, basically hit the reset button, got back on the same page. So all in all, between where I was stopping at trailheads and waiting for you guys, and when we hit Highway 20, when we stopped, I would say all in, we stopped and chilled out for probably about 50 minutes, give or take. You know, if you include probably, all of them. Yes, like we didn't probably stop 40 to much. 50 minutes. Still maintain a 28 mile an hour average, which if you actually dialed that in to what it really meant, we were probably holding somewhere, the, you know, in terms of actual uh, time spent on the trail. I wouldn't be surprised if we were averaging almost 40. And anybody that does any sort of off-road riding knows how rare that is and knows how fast that is. Like, uh, you know, granted, we did run in some pavement and stuff, but there were some sections of gravel where it was three, you know, you have essentially three lanes and we were ripping flat out ripping and that and that that fourth day we also had i mean you have to understand we also had six thousand feet in elevation change too yeah yeah. so rich multiple times rich made the comment to me like uh he's been you know i've been around when people have asked him what's what's the best ride you've ever been on in your life and rich rich always goes to this ride where we were it was the northwest utv crew blake wilkie and i led those guys out on a trail out of coos bay and we just had a blast we're just ripping around coos bay he loves that one Every time we pulled over at night, he was going, this is one of the most fun times I've ever had in a UTV. And that stuff stokes me up so much. Like when I hear that, I'm like, that's awesome. You know, we, you know, that was a fun night. That was fun for some riding, you know, and it was, it was a long night. It was a, it was a long <laughs> it was day a long and day night for and, sure. And but. there was a lot of stress that was involved with that day. But looking back at it, we can definitely, uh, we can definitely look back at it and be like, wow, that was a crazy experience and, and probably wouldn't have changed much of anything if we did, you know. To, to change it because of just what we've learned, what we've experienced, what we've seen. Um, those are all the things that uh, we as UTV drivers and, and participants in the sport are, are actually out there looking for. That's that's what we want. We want to come back with a story. We want to come back with an experience. And if you're just doing the same trail over and over and over again, you're just, you're not going to have those stories. I'm interested to see how that particular section shows up on the TV show because everything's going to be GoPro. And yeah. it's, and it still will, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's only going to encapsulate maybe about 20, 30 seconds, give or take, but in no way, shape or form is it going to basically explain to people how epic that ride was. <laughs> it was a good time. It got cold. It, I got, I got pretty dang cold. No doubt about it. It but, did start getting chilly towards yeah. the end. Yeah. So if I were to change anything about my car on that, on that night ride, I, it would have been maybe a higher output. Uh, floods on those cubes. They're they're the I have little radiance cubes up there right now, and they're they're pretty low output. So the the light bar overpowers them quite a bit. And even having that little bit helps in the corners, but I think having a little little bit more would have definitely helped quite a bit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, great great ride. We we did that fast pace, and there was a lot of night rides. So weird how you can be down down a trail that you explicitly remember, and it looks completely different, and then the experience is completely different for at sure. Night. For well, sure. it helps you going the other way too. And you're going the other way. But yeah. I just, I seem to remember going down that trail south and thinking, okay, I have to take it easy. I have to be a little bit off the gas. I have to dodge the rocks and do all that. But on the way north, none of that came into my mind. Like, I don't remember ever thinking, I need to stop and dodge those rocks or like, you know, slow down that, that sweep or whatever. And I think part of that is I already had the trail from the, from the trip down to follow so I was able to better navigate because I had more information whereas on the way south it was more of an open ended question of does the next turn actually turn that sharp or is it more of a sweep is it is it actually a sweep or is that a hairpin like um all that gets clarified when you can backtrack right and so yeah. I was able to be more confident in my driving yeah I missed a turn I was uh, a little bit zoned out in conjunction with the fact that uh, I had I had the wrong pavement section in the back of my head, so I overshot my turn by about three miles, and you guys took it, and so mentally I'm kind of calculating where it is, how far ahead of you guys, how how far ahead you guys are, and uh, I flipped around, came back at it, and. I'm not gonna lie, I was holding 85 for <laughs> a very large chunk of time, and uh, it's it. it Whatever confidence I lost in the car when that thing failed, I felt like I was trying to push the car to get re- regain it, and uh, I feel pretty good about it. You know, there's a lot more bump steer since moving to these these oversized tires, but uh, it it's something that we'll address. You know, 
Ben, yeah. ben is a backspacing a- expert, and we'll get her all dialed in. So, <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. So we ended up getting back to camp at about two a.m. Yeah. How did you? Uh, how was the experience of going from UTV to falling asleep? Dude, uh, motion sickness. You look kind of like <laughs> almost like you just hopped off a fishing boat. Honestly, I was so tired, and I told you guys this the next morning. Like, I've never slept in a truck. I've taken a nap or something in a truck, but sit, laying down in the driver's seat of a truck just doesn't work for me. But it was it was cold enough that night that I got in the truck, I fired it up, turned the heated seats on, and cranked the heat, and I was just gone. <laughs> <laughs> I was gone, like, within probably about five minutes, and I slept a solid three and a half hours, yeah. which... You know, I mean, I usually sleep about six to eight hours per night, somewhere in there, and that three and a half was very welcome. I was pretty stoked on that. Yeah, I just threw down the sleeping bag in the in the tent in the trailer and and pretty much was out. Yeah, and uh, Ben, I think you jumped in your truck and were out pretty much instantly. So, <laughs> um, yeah. and Rich was the same way. He he got back to the Wi-Fi at the, at the house and then was gone after that. So yeah, no, yeah. that's that's the other thing with Rich is is he's a machine. We didn't talk about the fact that to make this initial ride, he started out in Coos Bay. On a trip. Yeah. On a trip. Yeah, he was out doing it. And got in his truck, towed his trailer from Coos Bay to Con Connolly, and got on trail with us and did this week-long yep. thing, too. Yeah, and he's he's not a, a quick-to-get-home-out-of-work type guy either, so he works hard for long hours all week long, you know. And, uh, yeah, he's a machine. He, he is. He, he uh, And, you know, you could see on his face he was tired and ready for, for his, his time to, to sleep, but he was grinning ear to ear, you yeah. know. Yeah, so uh, Friday morning we had to go recover a four-seater. And so I, I'm just going to admit, I at, wanted to sleep in longer than I did. As a, yeah, oh, dude. <laughs> no, no doubt about that. Uh, yeah. But no, uh, I, you headed down south. Yeah, I headed down south. Like I, I, I basically, Rich had done so much on that trip that I basically said, uh, it's like, hey, dude, I'm going to hop in the rig and I'm going to go get this thing. And he basically said, oh, okay, I'll go with. And I was just like, oh, he just wants to sleep. <laughs> so, and that's part of what I thought. But we wound up going down there and retrieving those guys. And boy, you want to talk about two dudes that uh, whose total attitude towards life had changed. When we got Bam Bam and Brian, they were pumped, man. They were just like, let's get some coffee. Let's get some breakfast. They were all clean. I was so jealous. And Rich, and, I mean, I, I smelled like probably five days old of... Says the guy uh, that was only actually on trail for two days. <laughs> Yeah, but I just pulled off a twenty-hour day. So. <laughs> we were all pretty, pretty dirty at that point. There was yeah, no getting sure. around it for sure. And uh, so you guys picked up the car um, from the hotel and uh, the guys and, and headed back north. Yeah, we went and bought a burrito. That's pretty much what my diet consisted of: is beef jerky and a couple of burritos for the entire week, and then uh, rendezvoused with you to try and get back because we got back actually about noon. It wasn't too late. Yeah, Yeah, it wasn't too terrible. Uh, We got back, and Friday was dynamic footage day. Like, we were setting out to really just haul the mail and get them some cool trail footage. And the Washington BDR had a say in that (laughs) as to whether or not we were going to be able to pull that off. You notice that it's on the way back to the vehicle that it really gets us? Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, too, is, like, we we wake up that next day, and Ben, um, Ben wakes up, and... Ben's over it. Ben's loading up his car. <laughs> and, and, and I uh, I walk over to him and, and we're, like I said, we're on dynamic footage today, but I, I, I literally walk over to him and go, dude, I'm not going to say anything, but I am like so jealous of you right now. <laughs> I'm like, I, I am so ready for a shower and just, uh, just, you know. just the fact knowing he was going to hit a shower before you. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, so we headed up to the, back up to uh, North of Conconelli to get some more footage. And you ended up taking the side path over to the to the cave area. Well, right? the first thing we wanted to do is hit this cave, which uh, we've covered the cave on the vlog. Yeah, and uh, that's the first place that I wanted to take the guys. And I overshot, <laughs> and I, but I only overshot like by two minutes, and I was hauling so much that I'm just like, oh yeah, I'll turn around and just catch up to those guys. So I get there, I see no dust, I kill the motor, I hear no no engines. Fast forward 45 minutes later. 
And I drove back to the highway and just parked it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, I'm just going to hang here because there's no cell service at all around right. Conconoli. Con- uh, con- You'll get there. Conconoli. And uh, next thing you know, Brian and Bam Bam show up in Rich's Pro. And I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> I'm like, what now? And, and, and just the precursor that we, all three of us had left. Like you had left, Bam Bam's car has left, I had left. Yep. Rich had left. Yep. We were heading out to to capture some awesomeness, but uh, what happened? Yeah, so the whole trip, I kept hearing like this little clink, like whenever you would hard left or hard right, like maybe a hairpin, or if just when you were trying to drift it, you would hear this like this clink once you got to about, you know, 10, 15 degrees of, of roll, right? And I just thought it was like, oh, my axles are going, right? These axles have been in there for probably two and a half years. And uh, I even mentioned it to Rich like before like even his axles went like, I was like, Oh, I keep hearing this, like this, this clinking. I was like, oh, maybe it's my radius rods are loose or, you know, starting to oblong out the holes or something. And then they're just, they're kind of just jarring back and forth. And, uh, but the whole trip I was like, well, if I just don't push it hard to the side and don't hear the clink, then I should probably be okay. And, uh, well what ended up being was the, uh, drive line, the, uh, bearing caps on the T's, uh, were just working their way out. They had, uh, decided to no longer live and, um, which happens, which apparently happens. I, I've never had that happen, but it, yeah. it happens. And, um, yeah. So, uh, uh, uncle Ben who owns the razor has always complained about the noise from the drive line, and we've always chalked it up to just Polaris's drive line issues of being unbalanced and, and all that stuff. And which happens, which <laughs> happens actually a lot more. Yeah. Um, but uh, we we left the farmhouse, got on the on the highway to get to the trailhead, and uh, you guys had gunned it, and you so we were maintaining I don't know like forty five miles an hour or something like that. Keep going. And you kind of just gunned it, and I was like, oh. Well, I'm going to keep up, right? Like I'm, I'm always been so far behind on the trail that on the on the road I want to be right there. You got a turbo? Got the turbo. Use it. Yeah. And uh, and I gunned it, and then we had Brian in my passenger seat. Bam Bam was with Rich and the pro because the four seater was in the trailer, right? So they they occupied our our passenger seats, and so I gunned it, and all of a sudden we're just hearing a click, 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 and Brian looks at me. I look at Brian. <laughs> we're both just kind of like. So R- Brian R- is the variable the- <laughs> that's creating these problems. <laughs> yeah. So, so far, except for one person, which we can kind of write off as a Chad incident, was all because Brian was in the car. Yeah. So, right. yeah. um, I and- attributed it all to a bad beard. <laughs> and I told Rich, I'm like, I'm going home, I'm shaving, hitting the reset button. We're going to bring a new beard to Idaho <laughs> and just dominate. <laughs> so, Yeah. So uh, anyways, we pulled over and we're trying to figure out what it was diagnosed the issue and decided that we were going to try to radio for the guys to come back and tow us back to camp. And no one answered the radio <laughs> call. <laughs> so uh, we were we were there kind of at midway up a hill, you know, hillside. So I decided to take the radio up to the top of the hill, try to get some further reach on the, on the radio antenna. And uh, I almost got there and a guy uh, pulled up next to me in a brand new truck and trailer set up with a brand new, uh, I think it was a Rhino or, a, or something on it. And uh, ended up giving me a ride up the road to get to the top of the hill so I didn't have to walk all the way. And uh, yeah, so going down the freeway at, at freeway speed, holding onto the side of a rhino on a trailer behind a truck was was <laughs> was pretty unique. I, w- I was wishing I had grabbed the GoPro at that point. Um, but we got up and got to the top of the hill and he was like, are you sure you don't want to just, you know, keep going? So so I kept going all the way to the trailhead with him on the back, of the, <laughs> hanging off the side of this trailer at freeway speed. And uh at that point, I think I saw Rich and Bam Bam show up and said, oh, those are my guys. So I'll just get with them, jumped off the trailer, uh, said thank you to the guy, and then jumped on the back of the Pro. So now I was surfing the back of the bed of the Pro going down the freeway back to the Razor, and uh, we towed it back to camp and um, eventually uh, met up with you guys. Yeah. Uh, but uh, me and me and Rich at that point just decided to start cleaning trailers and getting ready to, to pack up and... Uh, Bam Bam and Brian took the pro up to film with you and um, up in the hills. And uh, at least your car was courteous enough to fail within about five <laughs> minutes, five minutes of the trailer. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I gave her the respect and she, yeah. she respected me back. So yeah. uh, can't can't blame the driveline for, for giving up, you know, for what it's been doing. And 
Uh, so we got that in the garage right now. We're about to, we got the parts to refix that and all that. But, um, but yeah, so that was the end of my trip. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> surfing on the back pros. So we, we disappeared back into the woods and, uh, on, on a local county road and we're trying to get some dynamic riding footage. And by dynamic, what Ian's really talking about is drifting, hard throttle, good stuff. The good stuff. Slow-mo. When the episode airs and the teasers for the episode start airing and the intro for the episode start airing, I, I would imagine they're going to use some of this footage. Like Brian was telling me, he goes, "We're gonna, I'm going to stand right in the middle of the road and you and Bam Bam go around me at like Mach 9. So Bam Bam and I come around this corner, just we're just coming in hot like you wouldn't believe. Neither of us can see him. We have right. no, no clue where he's at. So I'm just expecting just to take him out in any given moment. <laughs> and he always sets up in a different place than what we think he's going to set right. up at. So you just have to just kind of keep your head on a swivel. But uh, Bam Bam got some drone footage going. Oh, we, we I took him up to the cave. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, they got some cave footage. But my favorite part is Bam Bam wanted some drone footage. And so I'm pacing the inside line because we're too wide. We got plenty of room to see in anywhere where I couldn't see. I'd just duck in behind Brian. Um so Bam Bam's background is racing. He used to be a motocross racer, and he knows how to wheel, no question about it. Brian's background, Brian's a uh, film producer, but Bam Bam is one heck of a drone pilot. So Brian and I are kind of uh, just playing tag, going on uh, back towards this one Forest Service road where we head up the road. And I know this drone is following me, so I have to chat it up pretty pretty substantially. And like when we go into this corner, like Brian's kind of taking it easy going in there, I just freaking rail that thing. <laughs> just, I'm sure he, he said he cop captured. He said it looked pretty dang cool, but that, you know, you know how tra- dusty this trail is. And yeah, I mean, I started drifting into this 90 degree, or I'm sorry. Yeah, it was a 90 degree turn. I started drifting into it probably a solid 50 yards before the trail. Like I just threw that thing sideways and was full boost. So we, we got some good stuff. Uh, cool hill. Cl- I mean, you, you saw the hill climb going up to the cave. Oh, yeah. It's kind of cool. So we took the pro up and down that and the X3 up and down that. And, you know, so it wound up being okay. I think, I think after we, they left you, we were probably gone an hour, maybe two hours. Somewhere yeah. You were gone at yeah, least it, it, an hour and a half or so. It felt like a long time. It was a while because yeah. we had, at that point, Rich and I had basically stripped our trailers and cleaned them and put everything back yeah. ready to go so that when you guys showed up, we could just pull in. So at that point we were, we had done a, quite a bit of work and, uh, but yeah, so you guys were out for, for a while there. Yeah, yeah. I was bummed you guys weren't able to get up to Funk Mountain like we did on yeah, the Yeah, I know. I know for sure. But we're going back. We'll, yeah. we'll go back and do our thing. So it uh, it felt good getting into the cab of that F-150, though, and driving, <laughs> starting to make You were the, pretty quiet. <laughs> oh, I was I was wiped out. Yeah, yeah no doubt about everybody it. Everybody was. I didn't even put on any music. It was just like, give me a monster. I'll get us home. And from there, I make no guarantees. <laughs> So. so looking back at the Washington run, um, again, we were the, the whole experience was to run the trail and see how far we could get before we having to turn around and go back. Right. So, um, you know, having been on it now twice and now we're faced with this even larger expedition that we're going to be doing in Idaho. What are some of the takeaways that you have from Washington that you're going to take into uh, 1300 plus miles of Idaho running? Ride with more Yamaha YXZs. <laughs> Um, yeah, the pro, funny, the funny pro how there's the only y- one going. The, the pro and the YXZ <laughs> were the only things that weren't, weren't a casualty. Yeah. Um, my loadout is not changing a lot. I'm going to be packing a little more, a little more food, obviously. Uh, we're going to be farther between resupplies so that, that changes, you know, food loadout. Uh, as far as the rest of my, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I got hooked up with a, a, uh special bag that I'm pretty stoked about trying out and like a dry uh, bag. Um, what is that thing called? Um, Oh, that bag. Yeah. That bag. That's a, a 40 liter back country. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the stuff it's designed for motor, for a uh, trail, for trail bikes and stuff. And lo- really looking forward to, cause that's, that changes my, I have been using, garbage bags to put my sleeping bag and stuff in so they don't completely fill up with dirt. Right. And uh, this changes that drastically. 
That's funny because that's similar to what I'm doing is on the last trip, I took a bunch of camera gear and like Pelican style boxes and things like that. But the the sleeping bag was just in its own little cinch bag that it comes with. And the, the hammock was in its own little cinch bag and things like that. Um, and so my goal was to get everything that is, you know, malleable and, and something that I use at night and in the morning or whatever in a dry bag so that it's not just completely caked in dirt. And, uh, and so I've, I'm going from one dry bag to now four of different sizes to try to accommodate just that where I have one dry bag that's all overnight gear. So it's got my, my sleeping bag, my, or my hammock, my air mattress, whatever I'm taking is all going to be one dry bag. And I can just pull that bag out of the car and set up camp for the night. Yeah. Um, and so that's interesting you say that because that's kind of where my headspace was going. Yeah. Yeah, we've covered it. Uh, I've talked to talked to Ben about it, and you and I've covered it a number of times. Where I'm trying to I'm trying to put stuff on because you know with my background on moto and stuff like that, I'm trying to put stuff on my bike at the, or my bike. Hello, that is going to trigger. Whoa, some are you TV are guys. you from the south, boy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, from Brian's you just you just country in Tennessee, yeah. boy. Yeah. You just had half his viewership. My, <laughs> yeah, our, we just cut we our just subscribers got them over to saying certain words. I know um, bike being literal bike um basically i want my loadout on my utv to be able to transfer over to an adventure bike i think that that just makes sense for me and you know obviously we'll be able to pack a little bit more fuel or i'm sorry uh more fuel more more creature comforts and stuff on a utv but by and large if it doesn't fit on an adventure bike i want to try my best not to put it on my utv because i like to keep it light with the intention that you're going to get a bike and start doing cross style yeah, driving and not have to double up on resources like that. Yeah. I, I think my wife knows exactly what my plans are over the next year or two. She doesn't watch this. You're fine. No, she doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> I could be on Jimmy Fallon. They won't even watch that. <laughs> but what did you learn? You know, uh, the first thing I would say is, is to assess your ride out, uh, before you go on your suspension. Like there was, there was you, a lot you, to be done on my rig before we went you and, low. and, yeah. uh, you start loading up your car with extra stuff with your, your food supplies, your camping supplies, your emergency equipment, your tools, things like tools add up weight really fast. Um, and, uh, before you know it, your car is squatting negative squat. So, yeah. um, you know, if you're doing things last minute, you're going to end up going on the trail with an less than optimal experience like we did with ours on, on Washington. And so I would just say that, um, people in, in just general terms, a lot of times forget how much their car changes. If you put too much weight in, whether that be an extra person, an extra cooler full of beer or whatever the case is, your springs, your preload, your clutching, all of it comes into effect of how you're going to ride it. And if you go out with a fully loaded car and expect to drive it the same way you do on the dunes with just a cooler, you're going to be in for a big surprise. Yeah. And uh, so that would be my big recommendation for anybody trying to do stuff like this is to just take all that into consideration way in advance so that your car is completely ready and capable of handling the additional load, top, top end mass, you know, brakes, making sure your brakes don't fade because you've added so much more weight and you're driving way too fast. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. I learned that, um, that's something that's really going to come into play for me in Idaho is my brakes. Cause I've got a passenger and double the gear and bigger wheels and, and bigger wheels and tires. Yeah. So you're going to, you're going to have to kind of figure out be, where that, con that, yeah. that happy medium is on, on throttle and control and, yeah. and all that. To be honest with you, I think I'm going to be probably spending 90% of this trip on a green key in eco mode. I have no doubt in my mind. Well, when I rode with you in Conconally, like you were in eco a lot. A little bit, yeah. And a lot yeah, of it sure. was because there was just so much throttle there to like just jump out of, away from you that putting an eco kind of helped smooth things out a little yeah. bit. And then you would throw it in rock mode where you just sometimes w just you just wanted it to be super smooth because you were just bouncing around so much that uh, I can see that happening a lot on Idaho where you're yeah. just like just using your options, yeah. knowing how they affect your car, how they affect the throttle. That's another thing. Guys will buy cars and then instantly think they're capable of something amazing and not knowing how to use the car correctly usually ends up blowing the car up or, or wrecking the car or whatever. So yeah. knowing how all those affect your throttle response, how it affects your fuel mileage, all that kind of stuff is, yeah. a, is a big thing. Yeah. I mean, we're all learning stuff. No question about it. Ben, Ben's learned stuff too. His, his YXZ looks a lot different now than it looked this time last year. And, uh, you put a new cage on it. And I remember, uh, I remember following you in Priest Lake 
and the car has a top heavy feel to it that it didn't have this time last year. Absolutely. And I, I was following you pretty close, just looking at that going, well, he's having to get used to that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty, it felt tremendous different, you know, it, and then with this ride, I had a, I had a spare tire rack on the back of it, you know, for, for the Washington BD. And a roof rack. And a roof rack and the roof, you know, just the roof rack by itself. Cause I was, I was cognizant of the weight that far up that roof rack by itself without any other gear on it was almost 30 pounds. Right. Right. Yeah. So loadout is a big thing. Um, you know, and how that affects your ride cap- characteristics is a, is a huge part of that. And so I, I would challenge anyone doing this to go, like, we're going to be going on this trail with some guys, um, in Idaho and they've already posted that they've went out and shook, shook out the car and, and tested it and made sure it's going to be good to go. And they're, you know, two plus weeks out when they did that. So, um, taking the time, you yeah, have to take time. Well, we've got the usual suspects. We've got you in the RZR, we got Ben in the YXE, me in the X3, the other guys that are going, uh, the producers, it sounds like the producers are going to be an XP one. Uh, the other two guys that are going with us, a couple of former Navy SEALs are both in X3 Maxes. They're dialed. And then, uh, Cooper from off-road power products is going to be going And Cooper. I honestly, I can't wait for you guys to see this car. Cooper has a car that, uh, basically fab works just went to town on it's uh 80 inches wide. Uh, I think he's running a power tune. Something of that nature. Is this a Razor or X3? You no, know, it's an X3, and it's a Frankenstein. Let me tell you, it is a. Uh, it looks like something that should be on Mad Max. It is so tough. I've, I've just blown away. Like I can't wait to get it, get to see it up close. I have seen it, but I haven't really gone through it. And you know, Cooper can wheel too. He's gonna. He's in a car that's just gonna be. I mean, I think he's going to have so much confidence in that thing on that run because everything that can fail on an X3 has been addressed on that car. You know, knock on wood, anything can happen out on the trail, but uh, he took the right steps to get that thing set up. And so did the so did the two SEALs as well. They're, they're, It'll be interesting to see how the Maxes do on the trip. Um, I know this trip won't be as tight as the Washington trip was as far as navigating the trails, uh, but just the fact that they're such a big car and, and all the stuff that they have appointed on the car is, is it's a big package. So it is. it'll be interesting to see how it and does. And they volunteered and, to haul a lot of gear, which that's, you know, everything's going to feel that belts, um, everything. Belts, I mean, brakes, axles, yeah, clutching. For sure. For sure. So, um, as far as, uh, <clears throat> your ability to respond, uh, there, you could always talk about food and you can always talk about camping, uh, luxuries, but. Uh, the ability to respond to a situation. So we talked about having axles fail. We talked about an A-arm, uh, drive line, things like that. To what to what extent do you feel is a good c- compromise of having every single part and having nothing? Like, like we totally f- didn't bring the axles. That was our that was our bad. Like I had the axles in the garage on the counter ready to go on the car and I just never got it on the car and totally spaced it. Yeah. So, um, you know, what kind of happy medium do you think everybody should have a toolkit that can facilitate at least an axle change, a belt change, you know, maybe repairing a suspension part of some sort to get you back to civilization. Um, you know, what kind of loadout do you, at what point do you say this is too much stuff versus, you know, not enough? Well, and I, and I, that's going to vary on cars, right? Yeah. So, for, like, I mean, for the X3, I'm not going to say the A arm was an anomaly because everybody knows that that's a weak part point. But where I where I got taken out was avoidable, no question about it. You know, mindset. I, yeah. I mean, I I went up I went up that hill and it just got it was dumb luck. I went up that hill. Rich went up that hill like five times in his pro, and the pro ate it up. Um, the way that I was straddling this one line, and mind you, I was absolutely pinned in low range. And um, as the car drifted back into that runoff rut, uh, the side of the wheel hit the hit the basically the bank and just popped. That's all it, that's all it took, and it took it took the A arm out. So I think that's an avoidable situation. So for me, I'll feel good, and my plan is to have a tie rod, two extra belts, and an axle. So I would say that typically a tie rod's not something I would carry on a car for a trail ride, uh, but you're also going into until, a higher... you, until you drive a YXE. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So I know you guys have had experience with that, but uh, you you on the car you're adding bigger tires, you know, more mass, and you drive it hard with a tune. So a tie rod's very 
a very acceptable piece of hardware to, to bring with you, right? I would say that everybody should, if you're going to go on a long trail ride, to have a rear axle. You don't necessarily have to have a front axle, but at least a rear axle just because you never know when all of a sudden there's a pothole and it just hits wrong and your makes your clutch slip and then the, the binding on the axle and pop, it's gone. Like you just, that's one of those things where it's just, things can happen and you can blow an axle, right? So. Well, the biggest, the biggest thing whenever somebody asks me, so, you know, how do I prepare for this thing? The biggest thing is understanding what your vehicle can handle and what it can handle, where its weak points are. Knowing your car. Knowing your car. And like, for example, obviously I don't have a belt, you know, so that's, that's not part of my consideration. You should still carry one. But as we were (laughs) kind of joking around, I have two tie rods. Why? Because that's a known weak point in the suspension on my car. And you say two because they're not identical, right? They're, they're shaped specifically for each side? No, they're the same, both sides. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you just feel the need to have two. Well, they're not is, very heavy one either. Is, so. One is none, two is not, two is one. So if I put one on, you know, my tie rods are the same age. So if I, if I hit one and I pull one out, then how much life does my other one have? Right. You know, I changed both my tie rods just as a maintenance thing before we went on the Washington trip. Now I bought two brand new ones to put in my toolkit, but you know, it's like, like the, the axles, it's a known, it's a known weak point in some of the razors. So keeping that in mind, you find a way to accommodate the axles in your loadout. Right. And then how do you change it? Well, now you need to include those tools in order to make that happen. You know, when you're riding with, you know, there's going to be a number of X3s on the trail. So, okay, which tr- which parts are compatible? And then you get with your buddy and say, okay, these parts are compatible. I'll carry this if you carry that. Right. And you kind of do some sharing there. That's why I'm so mad at you guys for not getting X3s. <laughs> so. So that you guys can store all the gear that I plan on breaking. <laughs> so luckily, I think for the most part, like all the Can-Am axles are going to be compatible. Yeah. We're, uh, all, we're all 72s. And well, the, uh, Cooper's won't. Cooper's 80. It's all okay. custom RCV stuff. Right. And RCV but he, he's running an RCV. Anyway. He's not going to have to worry about it, no. right? And I think in some components, you get what you pay for. Like if you want to spend the extra money and not have to worry about it, and you're able to do right. it. Well, I can tell you as it relates to Idaho, I'm done. I'm done talking about Idaho in relation to it being an easier trip for us. I mean, I follow at least five different pages that monitor this run. We've got sections where guys aren't making it through because it's muddy, uh, snowed out. I think we're going to run into terrain that's going to be infinitely rougher than we're predicting. Um, The Burnt Knob Trail in my opinion, was going to be the most rockiest, most technical trail that we take on the entire run. And guys are saying that there's part of low, low pass. It's just every bit as rough as the burnt knob trail. But they're also saying that it's mud. Mud doesn't worry me. You know, rocky stuff will take out axles, especially when you're on an uphill pitch. And that's the one thing about that burnt knob trail is it's very, very rocky, but it's straight up too. So you, you got a combination of things you got to consider. Uh, the low, low trip, you know, the low, low parts of it. I'm, You know, I, I'm just assuming because there's such a big difference in adventure bike riders between a guy that knows what he's doing, that's super competent, super good on those things versus a beginner. And beginners on a big, heavy bike will get eaten alive for their first few years. And I'm just kind of wondering if some of these guys that are putting in this feedback about the condition the trail's in right now are just beginner riders. And I think that that's probably a big part of it. Well, and but, you have to think the perspective, too. Like a small, you know, a six-inch rock to a to an adventure bike guy is like, that's the difference between you gotta me, respect it. me dying and not yeah. dying. Whereas, Whereas well, to us, we're just like, oh, we either go over it or go around it. So one of the two, we're good. Right. So, and if you hit it, oh, then I, I should have ducked that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that, but well, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So um, just to wrap up on the loadout stuff, I mean, one thing I, I I didn't realize going into it was just how much of an effect having all the weight over the rear made. So I'm making it kind of a, a point to distribute the weight more towards the front uh, as much as possible. So I'm taking those uh, those socket sets and those things that are, are kind of just like dead weight and moving it to the passenger side where I don't have a passenger and evening out the, the left to right weight and the front to back weight so that the distribution is a little bit more 50-50. Uh, because for the Washington trip, I pretty much had about a 80-20 
weight difference on the the yeah, front rear axle. Yeah, you could axles. really see it. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was squatting pretty good. Yeah. Now I will say, for how much of abuse I I put that machine through in full squat, it it handled it like a champ. I I maybe bottomed out a total of five times. Yeah. On stuff I probably just should have probably been going slower on. So. Yeah, keeping in mind that your suspension was almost flat. When we started, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we when we finished, it was negative. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, and and another thing to consider is when you put more weight on your machine, your valving doesn't handle it the same. And so a lot of us just think about we just blame everything on the springs. You know, it's just it's just crappy OEM springs. It's just crappy this or that. Well, when you add another four hundred pounds of weight onto your car, those valves have to then take that much more force in through the valving. So um, that's that's where a lot of guys will blow valves out on the trail. You know, they'll load out a full camp kit, big tent, big cooler. You know, coolers will kill you, but um, they'll fully load out their car and then they go hit ruts and bumps and jumps like they would on a normal day. And then they blow the valves out on their shocks. So that's something to take into consider too. But uh, basically I learned that I can survive on nothing but jerky and, uh, and uh, like granola bars. <laughs> All so, I heard there was sodium. Yeah. It did make <laughs> me thirsty I can survive sure. on salt. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I never thought that, uh, cause I kind of figured that going into it, I would be just kind of done by day three, like, and wanting to like stop and eat Applebee's and whatnot. But what I found was eating that, that kind of big fatty richy food is what killed me like i was totally fine on on just the the trail stuff so take that into consideration with your diet how that affects your body and and yeah. if you're somebody that likes to eat like just start scaling Plan it back ahead. a little bit ahead of like yeah. the week a couple weeks ahead just start scaling back how much you're eating so that you're not on the trail trying to dispose of all of what you've consumed yeah. well and that that brings up a whole different conversation with the food that you take on your trips you know you need to be used to the food mm mm-hmm. mhm you can't just go, oh, I've never eaten this camper's food before, but I'm going to take it because it's light and I can just add water, blah, blah, blah. You really need to try that It's stuff. a shock to your system. It is. Especially if your road game sucks. Like if your road game sucks and you can't take a dump in the woods, you're in for a rough, rough few days. <laughs> no doubt about it. I'll tell you what, though. Uh, the lack of being clean just all over is something that some people can't handle. And if you're not in a prepared state to handle that kind of mess then you can really have a bad time you use the appropriate word <laughs> mess <laughs> yeah like when i took a shower after getting back home like i i can only imagine how bad sam and frodo smelled in their <laughs> nether regions probably was somewhere on board with what i wound up doing like right. it, it was just like i i was just i was actually like disappointed with myself it's like how did you let it get this bad yeah <laughs> I, yeah, I, when you're offending yourself, oh, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, it, was, it was rank, <laughs> rank. But uh, it, it just goes towards the concept that this is not for everyone. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend this style of, of trip for maybe a family that has younger ones. Yeah. Um, you know, I a couple think, days out, no problem. But, and you yeah. know, I've experienced with my family over the years with the four seaters and everything that, um, children, or I shouldn't say children, but just people of shorter height can have a lot of neck problems when it comes to riding like if they're wearing helmets and things like that just because their heads are getting bobbled around so much and after a couple hour ride it's like okay we're done we can get in the car and take off but if you're talking about multi-day excursions that's a big deal and like i found myself taking some advil once in a while to kind of help reduce that kind of inflammation in my neck but uh and i have some lower back pains but oddly enough it was always my neck that was the one that was sore it was nothing else so um Take that into consideration. If you're in a state or if you're on a trail system that requires helmets, that's additional weight to your head that is bobbling around and having to put that strain it causes on your, fatigue, and it, it can really take you out yeah. quickly. So, and different helmets have different weight. Yeah, for sure. So if you are sensitive, to, if you have neck or back problems, you know, <clears throat> you may consider getting a carbon fiber helmet and yeah. pay the extra money for it. Yeah. So, so that's that's Zach's advice. Ben, I'll, I'll cue you in on your advice. Here's my advice. <laughs> I I wore nothing but compression shorts underneath my clothes. Don't do that. Commando, <laughs> either either go commando, or wear loose fitting boxers to avoid that. Just I mean that just repulsive, utter just disgust in yourself <laughs> right after you get into. The, oh man, I'm still just yeah. I wrote it down on the calendar on this day. <laughs> so did any of you wear shorts, like instead of pants? 
And what was the outcome of that? Loved it. Loved it. It helped yeah. even with all oh, the dust. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, then dust is real. Yeah. Um, for Idaho, actually, for the first couple of days where we're targeting, um, where we're targeting camping is, uh, uh, alongside a stream, alongside a lake for the first couple of days, it's strategic. You know, these, these, these Alpine streams, these Alpine lakes are totally clean and trust me, I'm bringing a bar of soap and yeah. yeah, so yeah. we we kind of went into the Washington trip with the idea that we're going to stop at some lakes along the way or, you know, whatever. Like, And then we didn't, right? So um, I think that uh, going into Idaho, I think we need to really take that into consideration. Take the time, get clean, feel good about yourself going into the next day. And, and one thing I didn't do is get clean before going to bed, right? Like that's key for me. And I, and I watched you do it like you, every night you got clean before you went to bed and, and in the morning you just woke up, had whatever drink or caught, eat whatever. It's and, one of the reasons that I keep my sleeping bag, double bag my sleeping bag because sleeping dirty, it just changes your whole outlook in the next day. Right. For me, sleeping dirty is okay. It's sleeping sweaty. Like if I'm sleeping sweaty, I'm just, I'm just tossing and turning the yeah. whole night. Yeah. How, how epic was having that, uh, having that roto? Rotopacks with water on it. That was you some, that was something I learned was just how great it was to have fresh water in in some capacity to clean up with. Like we think about, oh, I'll just use the the water out of the jug or whatever to to brush my teeth or whatever. That's one thing. Being able to just tip a jug over and literally fill your hands with water and wash your face or clean your pits or whatever. I saw you on more than one occasion washing your washing your hair with I brought some shampoo, shampoo well, I, and again we thought about stopping at lakes along this right and so yeah. the whole idea was hey jump in wash up get back on the Don't car and go. Don't even listen to him listening audience he knew he was going to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I noticed he, that he that was, was combing that beard. Were going on. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd that go? Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah I did. I about, he's in makeup. <laughs> I'll tell you what you don't think about your hair that much when you're riding until you run your hands through it after a full day of riding and you're like, Oh, my hands can't move. And, and when you wash your hair and in your face and your, and your neck and all that, like it feels like you just lost 20 pounds. Now, now in this conversation, remember we're working through COVID, right? So how many of us got the opportunity to get a haircut before we did it? Because my <laughs> wife, I can't let my wife touch my hair because I will, I, I'm, I love a closed shaved head. Right. I like it short and my wife doesn't. So <laughs> if I leave it up to her, she's just going to like trim this and that. But the fact that some of us were like down to our shoulders almost, <laughs> you know, that, that, ma- that plays a part too. Yeah. It, yeah, it I, all comes I back. I buzz mine. Yeah. I got to tell you though, dude. So I, I told you I shaved the beard. You would not believe the dirt <laughs> under the beard that I, Two showers couldn't get off. Well, I then mean, I shaved it, and I see these dirt patches, just tons of these dirt <laughs> patches. And I'm just going, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, Ben saw me shave, washing my head. You know, it included my beard. Yeah. You know, I have more hair on my beard than I do my head. So, yeah. um, it was a big thing for me to also fall back further behind. I didn't mind being in the back because I knew that it was going to save me that feeling later on down the trail. So People are so pumped listening to our hygiene advice right now. <laughs> so if you fold the toilet paper, just... Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you go to Applebee's. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one thing that I did, uh, I did appreciate was the fact that I could use a real bathroom, you know? And so if you have the ability to have some luxuries along your trip... And, and just sprinkle them in where you can. Um, it does kind of help the overall experience and, and your attitude towards it. So, yeah. Yeah, I would say overall the trip, a lot of ups and downs related to part stuff. There was ups and downs related to moods. There was ups and downs related to, to, to how we were communicating. And there was ups and downs as to how we were enjoying the trail. I left the trail knowing full well I'm going to go after it again, and I can't freaking wait for Idaho. So, you know, I just, nothing broke spirits, still in it, going to gonna have a great time in a couple of weeks when we head out uh, on this Idaho trip. Once again, much like the Washington BDR, the Idaho BDR has never been done to completion on a, basically like a gumball style start, start at the start point and at the end point. No stopping in a UTV. Most of these guys have to move their rigs around or they take it down in legs. And I can tell you right now, when we go through Bonner's Ferry, Idaho, 
I'm going to be spending a lot of time at 80 to 90 miles an hour making sure that I'm the first one at the Canadian border <laughs> crossing to claim this thing. So just so you forewarned, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Hey, but if I'm, there's no one there to take the picture, yeah, it didn't happen. No, he's but, not. <laughs> but but here, here's the deal, though. Like, I'm, I'm going to be pumped that we're that we're the group that's going to take it down. No question about it. I mean, we've been talking about it so much that somebody's probably going to take down Utah. Somebody's probably going to take down Colorado. I'm totally into it. And, and whatever they do to develop content centered around those rides, I'm going to be the first one to watch it. So, yep. yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a competitive thing. It's an epic thing. And uh, we're just going to keep doing it. Well, I know we got some cool sponsors coming aboard for this Idaho run, Tons. and uh, we look forward to showing that to everybody and how it works out. We got some great product going on the cars for long-term testing. Yep, uh, that is going to be super stoked. I'm super stoked about, um, and uh, it's going to be a, a great time. I hope that uh, we're able to portray through the media we put out as epic as it is for us to be a part of it. So um, I I'm totally stoked. It's been a it's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of mental expenditure. It's a lot of it's a lot of a lot, and it's not for everybody, but uh, if you're looking to get into the overlanding game with your UTV, it's totally possible, and we're out to prove it, and we're going to show it off. So Absolutely. Anyways, uh, great trip, great uh, podcast. Thanks for coming all the way up uh, to have, be in the studio, Ben. Thanks uh, for having me. Thanks for bringing your kid over. Hi, over there, uh, yeah. off camera. And uh, uh, Ian, great show. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it, and you know, we'll see whether or not we have time to do another one before we leave, but uh, nonetheless. And and for the record, this is being recorded the week before we leave yeah. <laughs> for, for yep. Idaho. So yep. uh, be on the lookout for the Washington trip on Roku with uh, Moto Driven Films. If that's not live now, it'll probably be alive. Bef- it may very well be live before we go to Idaho, but nonetheless, that trip is going to be two episodes on a show called Gears, Rocks, Wrenches on MAV TV. That's going to fire up on Saturday, Thursdays and Saturdays in the fall. Uh, Thursday evening, Saturday morning, and uh, I'm looking forward to it, man. It's going to be pretty epic. Uh, just working with those guys, working with those producers, they it was it was a learning experience. It's been a blast. They're great people to be around, and I can't yeah. see what I can't wait to see what they come up with. So super stoked for that. Uh, we'll share all those links and content when they 100%. come out, and make sure that everybody has the opportunity to watch it. And uh, we'll be putting together you know a montage of our own. Uh, with what limited uh, <laughs> shots that we got yeah. while driving. Yeah. I'm going to have to uh, rely on you for a lot of that because I don't have room <laughs> on my car for my camera gear. Well, you weren't there half the time. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm talking Idaho. <laughs> but uh, yeah. for Idaho, we're going to hopefully do a full edit and a full product uh, produced cut for that. So uh, look forward to that. And uh, until the next time, everybody, peace. Peace.